no pressure. <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'll open the meeting. We're going to stand for the uh, Pledge of Allegiance and the invocation, if you don't mind. I'll just do the invocation first. Lord, we just like to thank you for uh, allowing us to come together and make the decisions that affect our county. We just ask that you guide us, direct us, give us wisdom, and that we make the right decisions. We pray for you, pray in. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Kristen, do you have any announcements first? I know we have a guest speaker coming up, but did you have anything you needed to go over before that? Okay. We have a lot of policy issues to get through tonight. Um, we're not making any decisions about specific par parking parcels tonight, only general concepts. Um, so that is not in the plan, you know, individual parking lot piece, pieces of property tonight. Um, and we really want to try to get some good recommendations moving forward to the county commission you know, the substantive policy issues, you know, like the fee itself and how it's distributed and the um, projects that are in there. Um, so I'm looking forward to this. This is two years in the making. Let's go. All right. Uh, Mr. Kosen, I think you have a guest that's speaking. Would you like to introduce him? A golf cart so my wife and I enjoy cycling down there and the last time we went on 38 we about got hit by four not automobiles but golf carts and they were driven by teenagers and nobody got hurt everything was okay but it was just driving the point home when the commissioners are saying what are we going to do with all these golf carts that's clogging up 30a and and the roadways down there so um, there's a I have a, a friend of mine that I uh, ran into through pr uh, similar interest. Uh, he's a problem solver. His name is Chaz Galloway. He's got a background in engineering. Uh, he's a brilliant young man. He takes air and makes money out of it with a series of ones and zeros called binary code, and they end up as apps. And he said, I can solve the traffic problem, and I've got some ideas to run by you. And by the way, the golf cart problem is just the tip of the iceberg on this app that can really help Walton County. So without further ado, Chaz Galloway, would you please come up and explain to us how you can help with the golf cart traffic problem and introduce us a little bit to Discover South Walton. Sorry. Um, let me give you just a little on my background, though. My name is Chaz Galloway, uh, Walton County resident. I live in Old Seagrove on 30A. Um, I, was, I was born here. I've lived here my whole life, and uh, I own a software engineering company which specialize, I specialize in mobile apps. Um, and I'm here today just to present a, lo a lot of ideas I have for the mobility plan that I think would be a great addition to what has already been planned by this board. And um, like Dan mentioned, I'm just, I'm a problem solver, but mainly I'm just kind of obsessive when I, you know, when I see a problem, I, I want to, I want to find the solution, you know, and that's just kind of the way software engineers, it's how our brains work. And, but we don't like bringing problems. We like bringing solutions. And, and I just, um, just where, as state, I, I live in Old Seagrove, um, three blocks from Seaside. So and I've lived there almost my entire life. And so the traffic situation has changed just drastically over the decades. And I mean, just where my house is located is probably one of the most congested areas on 38 by far. 
And uh, so naturally, I have a front row seat to this problem. You know, my, my entire life I've seen it. And it, it really is getting, I mean, even just this, these last couple weeks, it's like every year it just keeps getting worse. And the way my brain works is like I, I don't, I don't want to complain about it. I, I keep thinking, all right, how, how, do we, how do we truly fix it? You know, I mean, how do you really actually fix it? And so that just kind of was the mental exercise I've been doing and talking with friends like Dan and, you know, us trying to figure out how, how could this really be solved. Um, so, um, the, yeah, the problem I want to address is this, this massive amount of congestion on 38. I want to talk about some ideas I have. And um, I kind of, when I was thinking about, you know, the congestion and the traffic and um, in my opinion, I, I think it's a cause from this, what's causing that is just there are flat out too many cars on 30A. And we have not, as a county, presented our visitors with a viable alternative to driving themselves everywhere. You know, uh, I don't need to lecture you guys about this because this is something that <laughs> y'all are most definitely aware of and which you are working tires, tire, tirelessly to help solve, which is um, hence the current mobility plan, which I'd like to say I, I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed with and I, and I fully support. And um, so back to the problem of congestion, uh, when I first started thinking about this, um, how, how could you really truly solve it? You know, kind of like a perfect world scenario. Um, the, the conclusion that I came to is, you know, I'd love to see a 30A where visitors could could come here and, and they don't even need a car or a golf cart. I mean, they truly don't even need a reason to have one. Um, I think that would be like the definition of success because let's face it, we're not going to find we're not going to find more places for them to park. We're not going to want to build parking garages. I don't think anybody would. None of us really want to see giant parking structures. Nobody would support it. That's not realistic. Um, so, like I said, it, it just always got me back to we've got to find a reason for them not to even need a car. And um, now, this isn't as crazy as it sounds because there actually already exists some very similar platforms and systems that we are very familiar with in our culture um, that a lot of you are probably are already familiar with that have, that have achieved this kind of effect. Uh, the one that I'm going to talk about um, that kind of changed my life and really had a lot to do with me getting into mobile apps um, is uh, a platform called Uber, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with. Um, is everybody familiar with Uber? So anyone that's not, Uber's, you know, it's the world's largest taxi service. Um, what makes Uber unique is while they are the world's largest taxi company, they do not own a single car. Um, yet they completely changed how we think about public transportation. All Uber is is a mobile app that connects someone who needs a ride with someone who can drive them there. And that's, that's really important to understand because, um, you know, like I said, when, when you think of starting a cab company, you think of, you know, traditional t t taxis and maybe that company owns all the cars. Well, Uber said, why don't we just connect people who are close nearby who are willing to drive this person there um, with the person that needs it, you know, and, and it couldn't work without a mobile app, wouldn't work with a website, wouldn't work if you call them, it, mobile app is, is the key to it. Um, so where, you know, where this brings me to is just, just them controlling this mobile app um, that connects them with the driver. You know, the drivers are all independent contractors using their own car. Uh, when a user needs a ride, the app just connects them with the closest driver. Driver picks them up, drives them where they need to go. And, you know, because they were, a, you know, they achieved what we really, we don't see a lot, what, what's called a paradigm shift, where literally the way you think about something changes almost overnight. I mean, within five years, I mean, taxis have been around for a hundred years, ever since cars were, you know, came into existence, and then all of a sudden, Uber just totally changed that concept within five years. Um, it's called a paradigm shift, and you don't see it a lot. But that's the kind of thing that to, to truly you know, change. I, I think we really could, as a county, we could pull something like that off. Like, we, we have this big problem, but if we were smart about it, we could change things so fast 
that all of a sudden we would be laughing about, remember when, remember when we couldn't get anywhere on 30? Remember how congested it used to be? And then all of a sudden we created this thing. And, and believe it or not, that, that really is possible. But you, you, know, you have to uh, approach it in a unique way. Um, so I'm almost getting to my proposal. You, you probably see where this is going. But I, I personally really love Uber because now whenever I travel anywhere, I don't feel like I need to rent a car. And I don't feel limited at all not having a car. And that's what I always keep going back to is, you know, um, in fact, I, I think it kind of makes life easier not having a car when I'm in Chicago or New York or somewhere. You know, I, I don't, I don't want to have a car. And um, I truly think people who come here, I, I don't think they're necessarily attached to having a car or having a golf cart. I think they're attached to the freedom of being able to get wherever the heck they want when they want to go there. You know, so... I think that's what we need to try and strive for. Just how can we give that to them, um, you know, in the simplest, fastest way? Um, and I, so I, I think that's the experience that we should strive for. And, and I'm going to present to you some ideas of how we truly could do that very fast. And, and it goes right along with everything that this board has um, has already talked about doing. Um, so. Uh, yeah, if, if we could replicate that in the form of something like Uber, but designed it specifically for the, the South Walton you know, market, I think visitors would have no problem with just flat out not even, you know, maybe parking their car at the beginning of the week and not having to use it, um, or not even having to have a golf cart of their own. Um, and I think they would happily use a system like this as long as it gets them where they need to go the minute they need to get there. So that's what I'm, um, I'm kind of here to propose and just tell you about. Um, Great. Uh, <laughs> the golf cart Uber thing is just the tip of the iceberg on Discover South Walton. It's, so you're just talking about that, what, uh, what Jazz hasn't gotten into. Everything you need. Right. Is on the app. If they want groceries, if yeah. they want a delivery from the liquor store, if they want uh, a pizza, if they want anything, if they want to be in Maine and they want to rent a beach house for the weekend, uh, it's all on this one app instead of these apps going, uh, the money, the booking fees going to high tech companies on the West Coast. The mobility plan fully supports a private company coming in and doing that, um, what that structure would be in the future, but the mobility plan's about the infrastructure to make that happen because the, the, the issue still is, you know, ordering traffic by speed. But there would be a place for those golf carts, you know, on-demand golf carts if the mobility plan were to be implemented where, you know, people, a private company could come in. I don't know what structure that would look like, but, you know, you know, obviously, if it was something operated by us, that would be a bid process. That's not something that we can decide tonight. Um, or if it's a, just a private operator operating on the infrastructure that's there, um, it's that's fully doable, um, and there are no changes required to what we're talking about tonight. So what we're uh, what we're talking about now is I'm bringing to the board's attention some concerns that um, the commissioners have. They're wanting to solve a traffic problem right now. And this mobility plan is going to take years and years and years to go to, into effect. And we're not going to see any immediate results. We're going to go through a long planning period. Um, we're going to go through a lot of workshops. We're going to try and get this off the road. But he's talking about an immediate solution right now, right now. Yeah, that, that, that's um – I was just here to present, you know, bring my expertise and explain that this is really, um, it's, it, it's amazing how cheap and affordable, how fast you could get to something like this. And it, it, like, and it doesn't really require golf cart, the county on to the, buy. On-demand golf carts, we've got that operating now. There are two private companies doing that now on the right. corridor. I, I guess what I was proposing, like, is the county would have the platform. Well, we and can't. Would sign we can't. Up and yeah, yeah, I mean, that's. We definitely can't. That that if the county, you know, that's. So connect. Uh, co correct me if I'm wrong. If he's got a solution, a viable solution, that's a concern of our commissioners, and it's uh, it's something that could be uh, implemented very inexpe very inexpensively, 
and very rapidly uh, to offer a solution right now, real time. But are you talking about golf carts on demand, dropping people on and off on our current infrastructure? Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, so uh, talking about a county um, sponsored rideshare program where people, um, drivers with their own carts, could sign up through the platform. So basically, the, basically, the county would control the app. More golf carts in the current. I mean, this is an a, this 38 is a, corridor. This I don't think a, that's the direct. I mean, this I'm is just a subtraction <laughs> problem, not an addition problem. Yeah. Right? Like, it, it really it, it gives them a reason to not need their own because when they walk out of their house, they click a button, it shows up and takes them there, so they don't have to find a parking spot. This could actually relieve congestion. Like I said, I mean, this is a solution for subtraction, not addition. By far, like I, I would definitely not be suggesting that. Instead of having a golf cart at every rental house uh, between uh, 98 and the Gulf of Mexico, this is designed to reduce uh, a large majority of those golf carts. Uh, can, let's, can we talk about this issue like in a, in a meeting like with the consultant? Because there's a lot here to unpack. The reason it was suggested that he be a guest tonight is because it is mobility uh, plan oriented for immediate solutions. And if you want to go ahead and cut this short because you've got a lot on the plate tonight, I think this is uh, worth listening to. I well, think I, it's worth considering. I, I think we covered it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a um, – I, I was just here to, you know, give yeah. my expertise on it. That's all. No, I do on. understand the concept, and I didn't mean to – and this is certainly up to Lee, but we have a big agenda tonight. And um, I think, you know, right now the current situation um, with golf carts is is negative. And um, we do have some ride share programs that are operating down there with golf carts. You can one of them is called Goop. Goop. Yeah, no, I'm familiar with Goop. them, and and, you know? um, and I've talked to them. And it, it's more of um, I think that's a good example. Like if the county could put this together, it would basically allow programs like that to talk to it and it would be you know a one-stop shop for everybody like a small private company doesn't really have the chance to pull it off like the county can and I would just like to see the county actually you know truly try to solve it rather than just you know hey private company you figured out because we and they we, couldn't do it like the county could is all and we've patronized these private golf cart shuttle companies and the way they would patron, the, the way they would communicate with us is when we pulled up into the county parking lot there, um, on the road that goes down into Grayton Beach, the big county uh, parking lot. They'd come up to us and give us a business card, and uh, that's how they communicate. And this right here puts everybody on an equal playing field. Everybody's out there, and it's it's more connectability. You're connected with all the golf carts out there, not just one company. So, um, well, I think this is something that needs some definite, you know, research and everything. And you may have done a lot of that already, but I don't know that that's exactly what we're here for now, because uh, it sounds like it's going to bring up a lot of questions. And uh, I don't know if you've already got an app set up, or if this is something you've, you've been working on. If it, if it's, if it is, then it's something that I don't know that our board is the place that comes up with those kind of problems uh, yeah, solving. You know, Bill, I mean, we the usually hear what's going on the and problem. then we make a recommendation, move it to the county commissioners. Sure. I, I was trying to, yeah, just see if, trying to promote the idea of it. And, well, the uh, idea sounds if, great. I'm just not sure um, where, where it needs that, to start is what I'm saying. I, I, I think there's another, probably another venue for us to, to well, recommend take, that this go to. If, if this wasn't handled correctly, this is my bad because the impression I was under is if if the commissioners are looking for an immediate solution and we like his idea, then we pass it up to the BCC to implement it or not. They can either choose to implement it or they can choose not to implement it. But it's, if it doesn't get by this board, then it's not going to be implemented. And if this board is not happy with not knowing enough information, then we need to reschedule Mr. Galloway to come back and give him another presentation at a time more convenient for everybody. But usually this goes through the planning department before it comes straight to us. Yeah, we would need to model and yeah. do all kinds of work to see if this would actually take vehicles off of 30A 
You know, I mean, to add more golf carts yeah. when you're not sure that. I'm not trying to you know, discourage that, what you're saying. I'm just saying I don't think it's a big come to us the right way. It should go through the planning department. They've got the, the process that they go through before it comes to us. Okay, so, and edu so educate me on this. Last meeting, we had Debbie Hurd here to present the Clean Water Init Initiative for the Choctahatchee Bay. We're trying to clean up the bay, and we're trying to lower the uh, the um, contamination, the human contamination that's in the bay. So the the planning board here, they liked what she had to say, and she and we pr voted to present this to the BCC. Now next meeting, they're going to have uh, the Choctahatchee Bay Clean Water Ini Initiative on their agenda. So I thought that's how it worked. I thought if it got on. If, if we like the idea here, that we could pass it up to them, because that's how it worked with Debbie Hurd, and I'm not seeing, seeing how that's work, working I'm, the same way here. So just explain to me the difference. The, the mobility fee and plan is about traffic solutions, solving traffic problems. There's a fee associated with the improvements right. that we make in the mobility plan. I get it. And we have to tie those to actual reductions in vehicle miles traveled. So the mobility fee cannot be paid cannot be used for anything that doesn't reduce congestion or add capacity, it, you know. Right. So we would need to be okay. really sure of that before, you right. know, and there's a lot of modeling and work that's gone into this plan. Okay. And I'm, so and, we can't and, just chunk something in there at this point. And I'm yeah. a supporter of the mobility plan, but the mobility plan is going to take how many years to implement, and he's talking right now. We, we could get – us. A good portion of this done in the next five years. Five years. And the TDC is running shuttles in the interim, so there is interim planning going on with transit um, that's happening right now, starting now, right, Dave? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's not like we're not doing anything now, um, but I think that the Grayton connection, we just applied for a grant last year for $12 million. We get another opportunity coming up. You, If we can get this plan adopted, you may be surprised how quickly we can move. Um, it's just we need to get the planning done. And, you know, we need to be sure that anything that we charge a developer a fee for, which is what the mobility plan in, is about, reduces traffic and that it adds to capacity. Otherwise, we're in a bad uh, framework. So th this this document really, is, it, it, we all keep, you know, talking about it, but it really is about the fee, the fee. And, and the legal basis for the fee is the plan. Does that make sense? It's really a separate issue because you're talking about a solution years down the road, which I am support of. I'm support of. He's offering a solution right now, and we're not going to solve this problem tonight. And we're not. And I don't want to beat this to death any further. But I would like to say, Chaz, I think you got an excellent idea. I think. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm, no, I'm, I appreciate I'm sorry the it time. wasn't received. Oh no, it's fine. Yeah. I, uh, it sounds like. Uh, but in Somebody the sake of time, we're going to have to move on. Hey, it's on. already in the plan. Yeah, I, I didn't know that, and that's that's well, great. That's great to hear. I mean, it really. Um, I did. I wasn't aware that we were already thinking that way. So, totally understand. I'm, just, I'm always here to. Uh, we're looking for a solution like right now. It's what I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah, me as well. Yeah, me as well. And that's kind of how I'm usually thinking. Like okay. six weeks out, you know, not six not years, three years so, out. Uh, but I get um, it. Okay. I'm always here. Yeah. Mr. Gallagher, we appreciate you coming in, and I think you probably have some great ideas, and we'd love to get more into it at some point and I, I just want to make sure that we're doing it the right way because it looks like a lot of what he's talking about may already be in this and it may be some things that need to go through the planning department so that we can implement it at the same time and then talk about it uh, once they've had a chance to look through it too because I'm not used to things coming too straight to us I know that happened last time that's the first time I'd ever seen it happen mm -hmm. 
So I'm not sure that's exactly the process that should take place. I'd like to find that out. We took care of business and did something government doesn't usually do, and that's move on something good quick. We made a decision. We went forward next order of business. Yeah, but we're going to set a precedence if we're not careful where everybody's going to bypass the planning department, come straight to us. And I'd prefer it go through the proper channels to make sure we're doing it the right way. So that's all I'm saying is let's just make sure we get it done the right way. Yes, sir. So that we uh, let's move on. All right. Um, Kristen, are you ready? All right. Yes, sir. Good evening, Planning Commissioners. Jonathan Paul, Principal of New Urban Concepts, to uh, discuss the mobility plan and mobility fee before you this evening. Uh, next slide, please. So currently, the county system for, you know, the, the whole intent of a mobility plan and mobility fee is to provide an alternative way to regulate development and to ensure that they're mitigating their impact. So basically, you know, if there's enough cars on the road or how much traffic they produce, that's being addressed in a, a systematic way. And so right now what the county currently has is what's known as transportation concurrency and proportionate share. It's a rule that was put in place by the legislature back in 1985, and it was simple at first. If you had a development, you had to show how you could accommodate that traffic based on the current roadway system. And if you couldn't do that, you had to provide new roads, or you had to pay for the roads. And that worked well for a while in rural areas and suburban areas, didn't work that well in urban areas. Um, and you know, 30A is kind of a, a case in point. If you have a new development going along that roadway, it's not necessarily the community's desire to see 30A widened. But that's what transportation concurrency says, is if you're gonna mitigate your impact, you gotta widen roads. And so we're really looking to, to move beyond that um, because that's not something that this community necessarily embraces. And also the Florida legislature has changed a lot of the rules in terms of how local governments regulate development. It used to be 10 years ago, the county commission could stop a developer because there was no capacity on the road. That's no longer the case. The legislature no longer allows that. Legislature basically says any developer has the right to pay there for their impact and go and if they happen to be on a roadway that's already over capacity, they don't have to pay anything and it's the responsibility of the local government and the taxpayers of the community. So that's the, the system that's in place today and we're looking to provide an alternative system. Next slide, please. And really, it, it is a fundamental shift talking about moving people as opposed to moving cars. Whether they're walking, biking, using transit, using some new mobility technology, using an app, to, to summon a ride, to summon a golf cart, that's all something that this mobility plan's looking at. Because really, you know, there, there's one way to move a car, and that's to drive it. There's a lot of way to move people. Next slide, please. And so the mobility plan looks out over the next 20 years and identifies transportation improvements throughout the entire county. Not just along 30A, not just along 331 or Freeport, we're looking at the entire county. And the mobility fee is essentially a, a mitigation paid by developer. They come in, they're gonna look at a, a table, they're gonna say um, this many homes, this many square feet, this is what I pay, I make a check to the county, I'm done. I've mitigated my impact. Then the county then takes that money and goes and builds the improvements that are identified in the plan. And the intent of the plan, the mobility fee is to replace concurrency and proportionate share. Next slide, please. And so Walton County would not be the first. Um, I actually did the first one in Alachua County in, in Gainesville, Florida, uh, about 12 years ago now. And it was really the, the first you know, dramatic shift away from concurrency. And it said, we no longer want to focus on solely building roads, but we want to have new roads, new bike lanes, new trails, new bike facilities, uh, new transit, and development's gonna pay their share of it. And so a lot of other communities have now jumped on board um, just in the panhandle here alone, I'm working on Okaloosa County's mobility plan and mobility fee, and also mobility plan and mobility fee in Leon County. And so it's something that's really taking hold. And, and one thing uh, to stress here this evening, a mobility fee is only one source of revenue to pay for plan improvements. 
development didn't create all the issues that are here today. They're not going to create all the issues in the future, but they're a part of the, the issue and part of the solution. So they'll pay a share of it. And local governments that have found themselves successful, success in terms of being able to address congestion, have an infrastructure sales tax. They have a full gas tax. They have either a roadway impact fee or a mobility fee. And then they have a plan, and they use that plan to go after state and federal funds. So right now, Walton County doesn't have a plan at all. It misses a lot of opportunities to go after funds. Um, there, there's still actually, I believe, five cents of the, the gas tax still hasn't been allocated yet. There's not an infrastructure sales tax. So there's a lot of opportunities for this community to look at as you continue to grow and as you experience you know, major traffic issues. There really is a need, and we'll sort of highlight how much that need actually costs. Next slide, please. And so, and Kristen mentioned this a little bit earlier, you know, 30A and 98 are really good examples. So you have cars driving 25, 30 miles an hour on the road, and you have people on the, the pathways walking, pushing strollers, bicycling. Then now you've got this other mode of traffic coming in, golf carts. They're going 15 miles an hour. They go too fast on the pathways, too slow on the roads. Coming right behind them are electric bicycles. Electric bicycles also go 15 miles an hour. And coming right up behind that, there are electric scooters. <laughs> and, you know, there's a lot of consternation about scooters and the thought of that. And right now, the, the county currently has a moratorium on those. And it's something that we're, we're looking to address. But really, what's missing in the transportation system is how do you accommodate that mode of travel going 15 miles an hour, whether it be a scooter, a Segway, an electric bicycle, a golf cart, an autonomous transit vehicle. Get them off the pathways on 98 and 30A, get them off the streets. And so really that's part of the mobility plan is looking at how you accommodate these different modes and how you accommodate different modes of travel in terms of how fast they're going. Next slide. Um, roughly a year ago, we were actually would have you know, proposed doing this presentation last March or April. Um, and of course, COVID hit and sort of delayed everything. But we actually had a, a fairly large um, mobility workshop over the weekend in Seaside where we had autonomous transit shuttles. An autonomous transit shuttle is basically a shuttle that doesn't have a driver. And it's going along the Seaside loop. You had golf carts there. You had uh, neighborhood electric vehicles. You had electric bikes. You had a lot of this technology that's available today that could be accommodated today if it had a place to ride. But at right now, the only place it has to ride is either on the pathway or it's on the street. And so really, this isn't something 20 years in the future. And, and a lot of these technologies, you, know, you mentioned, they're all connected by the app. A lot of these things that you, you could do out there are connected by that. The big issue is if they're connected by an app or they're connected by anything, there's no place for them to go because the, the, the traffic's already bad on the roadways. The paths are already full with people walking and biking. So really looking at the mobility plan is laying out the plan for that, and we'll discuss that as we go into the seaside cross-section. Next slide. Um, you know, we've heard a lot of discussion of, well, this mobility plan is really not needed. It's all just tourism. You know, it's only a couple of, of months out of the year. And, and, you know, we see things different in terms of the planning department, the future land use developments that are already approved. And then you just drive along 331 or 98. And I just noticed in the two years that I've been coming up here working on this, pretty much all of 98, the entire section there, has for sale signs on it now coming all the way up from, you know, from 98 going north to the Funiac for sale, for sale, for sale. What folks don't realize is there's a lot of high and dry land, especially right around where you're at today. And there's a lot of development coming to, to the magnitude of, you know, 500,000 increase in vehicle miles of travel. Or I believe, I'll go to the next slide, please. Yeah. Actually, six million increase in vehicle miles and person miles of travel just in the next 20 years. And, and that's a fairly significant bump. Um, that's countywide, 76%. Where we're actually sitting this evening, 
We're projecting traffic over the next 20 years to increase 152%, and in South Walton, 97%. So there's a lot of demand that's going to come from development that's allowed in the county's comprehensive plan today. Not tourism, not growth, not Okaloosa, not Bay. What's actually allowed today and what's already been approved through the St. Joe's development and what's already been approved along the 331 and 98 corridors. So there's a lot of traffic coming and you already have issues today. Next slide, please. So it's just, you know, basically showing the, the numbers and they're significant. There's a lot of projected growth that's going to occur in this community. A good portion of it is driven by the St. Joe's development down on 98, but a lot of it's also, you know, all heads got approvals. You've got a lot of other projects that have approvals. Maybe they've stopped because the market isn't quite there, but as you see all the construction that's going on now, you know, your community, it, it's coming. Next slide, please. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. This is a little bit, um, these things are hard to see at this level. Basically, we have this information, it's called streetlight data, based on your cell phone, and we tracked it. We were modeled pretty much the whole county in 2019. We're looking to do the same thing in 2020, and then things hit. But what we're seeing is, outside of the, the seaside watercolor area, your peaks last from March to October and are even starting to expand further and further beyond that time frame. So it's not necessarily just the April, May, June, or June, July tourism season. You're starting to witness a lot of congestion and a lot of consistent traffic throughout the entire course of the year. Next slide, please. So the mobility plan itself is actually comprised of nine separate plans because there are so many projects. When we originally started, we all tried to put them on one or two maps, and it got so busy and so confusing, you just really couldn't understand what was going on. So there now are actually, there are nine separate plans based on the mode of travel, and there's also a needs plan, and we'll talk a little bit more about when we get there. Um, the projected cost is $700 million of the projects that we've identified over the next 20 years. And that's not fully accounting for one of the proposals on, on State Road 81. Um, I'll go into each one of these in a little bit more detail. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just for members of the public that are out there, we've tried to be fairly transparent through this whole process. There is a lot of information available on the county's website. They have an entire page dedicated just to mobility. Um, we've gone through a lot of changes over these last few years, but everything we're discussing this evening and everything going uh, moving forward is available on this website. So just for any members of the public, check it out if you haven't had an opportunity to do so. Next slide, please. We also have a, an executive summary, which some of the, the reports we have, you know, one of them's uh, over 100 pages long. Um, this executive summary is a lot of pretty pictures and maps and gets short and to the point. It's also available on the county's website to download if you want to find out more information. Next slide. And so the first part is the, the bicycling plan for Miramar Beach and Sandestin area. And what we're really looking at are opportunities to make it safer, to be able to cross and walk along 98, along scenic 98, to add sidewalks on communities north of 98, and also to add connections along Driftwood and Ellis um, to get you down to, to Miramar Beach. And so the, the mobility plan itself identifies you know, trails, bike lanes, sidewalks uh, throughout the entire Miramar Beach and Sandustin area. Next slide. We were also looked at transit and the potential of, you know, whether it be golf carts, autonomous transit shuttles, trolleys, some form of transit going back and forth on Scenic 98, going from roughly the, the Silver Sands outlet to Grand Boulevard, and then eventually going on to Destin. So the mobility plan sort of looks at all those modes and those green circles and blue circles you see there, those are identified as mobility hubs. Um, we've had a lot of feedback, some good, some not so good. Um, in terms of some of the opportunities for these hubs, um, the, the yellow one itself is really the driftwood project that the, the county owns today. Um, the blue is looking at a future park once parking structure, um, potentially at Silver Sands or some other area. 
And the idea is, you know, as the gentleman talked about a little bit earlier, to get people coming to this community to park once and to use some other form of transportation to get around, whether it be a golf cart, a scooter, or a ride hail, or, or some other service. And so there's definitely some um, validity to what was said. And, and actually, I believe this summer, the TDC is going to be releasing several pilot projects doing just that, running cer certain levels of transit service along 30A and along Scenic 98, connecting some of these future mobility hubs and really trying to prove that concept. And last year, they actually did it fairly successfully with the uh, service going down to Grayton. Next slide, please. And so th these are sort of the mobility hubs that we laid out. There is a regional one, which really there, there are two proposed, and that's sort of the, the, the concepts that were mentioned earlier. Get people to come in, park once, and use some other form of transportation to get around. Be able to access a lot of the beach connections. We're proposing neighborhood mobility hubs, and those are really more provide a covered area to wait to be picked up by a summon golf cart, to wait to you know get your bicycle, to get your scooter, to get some other form of transportation other than the drive. Uh, what we've noticed is that most of the neighborhood beach access and most of the regional beach access are all way over capacity along 30A and Scenic 98. And there really needs to be some solutions of how do you get their people there safely and not necessarily have them parking along the rights away of both those roads. Next slide. Again, we also looked at dedicated lanes, multimodal lanes, our specific lanes on Scenic 98 and 30A for golf carts, bikes, and scooters, getting them off the, the paths and roadways. We had a propose both for, for 98 and for uh, 30A, and then longer term through 331, and even coordinating with DOT here eventually out in Freeport. Uh, next slide, please. And here's what they look like. Essentially, you know, some people call them bike lanes, people call them paved shoulder. Essentially, we're looking at narrowing the travel lanes on Scenic 98, adding additional space. Um, and if you, if you look at some of the on-street parking that's already out there today, there's already sort of a five-foot, six-foot area that's separated from parking and travel lane. That would actually essentially be what this graphic's showing right today. So, I mean, there's a lot of these things that could actually be accommodated relatively quickly, relatively inexpensively, and, and put in place and actually provide real mobility um, in a timely manner, not 20 years in the future, but in the next year or two. Do you open up the public comment no. right now? No, ma'am, we don't open up public comments until after the presentation. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And, and so we're also looking to potentially propose also expanding the existing trail. That's only eight feet out there today upwards to 12 or, or 14 feet. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one of the big issues in, in this part of the, the community is safety, especially on US 98, if you've ever actually, you know, whether you want to or not, walk or bike along that corridor, it's relatively dangerous doing so, and um, it's, it's almost impossible to cross as well. So the mobility plan actually identifies safety improvements along all of US 98 to make it safer, where you don't have a raised median to provide one, where you don't have actuated buttons where you can press a button and traffic actually stops and you can cross the road to actually put one in. And also as part of the improvements to uh, Scenic 98, lowering the travel speeds as well. Next slide, please. And so this is just sort of an, an image ultimately of you know, how you could envision the, the mobility plan. Um, the, the graphic sort of shows what 98 looks like today. Uh, the first part of the mobility plans, doing some improvements to the sidewalks to make it a little bit safer and a little bit more visible crossing driveways. The next phase would make the, the bicycle lanes wider and make them more visible to traffic. Third phase would actually put in a raised median along 98 and provide crosswalks uh, where there aren't any. And then the fourth phase really is ultimately if the mobility plan is successful, you basically use other modes of travel to accommodate traffic, as opposed to eight landing 98, maybe you look at something that's more multimodal in nature. And because right now, I mean, if nothing is done, 
the, the volumes and the models show that 98 from Bay County to Okaloosa would need to be eight lanes the whole way. And, you know, so if you don't do anything and just say just cars, traffic, let's do it, you, you're looking at a, an eight lane future both of, of 98 and 331. Next slide, please. Part of that is also looking at the speed limits along 30A and 98 and coming up with, with more realistic expectations. So when you're going across the beaches, where you're going through Seaside, going through Alice Beach, going through Rosemary, you, know, you really shouldn't be able to expect to go through there at 25 miles an hour, or maybe it's 15 miles an hour. In reality, right now, today, it's probably zero. Um, you know, there's a lot of congestion that goes along those areas. But really looking at the, the speed limits as part of the overall mobility and saying what's appropriate in these areas. Next slide. Switching over to the, the basically calling the South Walton 30A area. Um, these are all proposed bicycle and pedestrian improvements, non-motorized. So the intent's not to allow scooters or bikes, electric bikes or golf carts on any of these facilities. And there's a lot of them. There's using the power line north of 98. There's proposing forest paths, which are basically are intended to be, you know, also serve as fire breaks along the backside of development parallel to 30A, but basically a, a stabilized surface other than the, the sugar sand that's out there for the most part today to allow anybody, you know, whether pushing a wheelchair, pushing a stroller, or maybe they can't necessarily ride a bicycle through sugar sand to actually be able to use those a, as a means of transportation. We're also all the gaps that exist. There's a lot of sidewalk gaps and pathway gaps on Old Blue Mountain, on um, 283, on 83. You may not necessarily know them when you're driving by, but if you actually get out there and you try to ride your bike, you notice a lot of them stop before 98, or they'll stop before 30A. Some of those are already under design today to be improved, and the mobility plan sort of goes that next step with a real focus on having a network. So you can basically safely, besides just the 98 path or the 30A path, you could actually get up to the, the Publix in, in Santa Rosa, you get to the Walmart, you get to the schools, you, you get to the sports complex. Today, you can't necessarily do that because there is not a connected continuous facility going from 30A to those areas up on 98. And this plan does just that. And a lot of these improvements, several of them are under design today, but these are things that can be implemented fairly quickly and relatively inexpensively um, you know, compared to a, to a roadway. Um, but it's something really longer term. This is sort of the first holistic look at how you, you know, provide a real network for people walking and biking in this area. Next slide. We also are looking at a transit plan, both along 30A and then along the 98 corridor. And it's a little hard to see at this level if you actually have the map, but there's actually, you know, lines all along 30A that connect Grayton, Seagrove, Seaside, and Watercolor. Then another line that connects Alice Beach, Rosemary Beach, Inlet Beach, and another connecting Gulf Place and Dune Allen. Those are actually all transit routes that TDC is looking to provide some level of service on this summer as sort of a proof of concept. So these things, again, aren't 20 years in the future. These things, it was already successfully done going down to Grayton Beach last summer. There's several of these corridors that are now going to be looked at. The county owns property on 283 in Grayton. They own property in Gulf Place on 393. So these you know, ideas to start making those active uses for people to park and start running some level of transit service from that, whether it be a golf cart, whether it be a transit vehicle, a trolley. So these things will actually be happening this year. And so a lot of this stuff is moving forward fairly quickly. And then depending on the, the proof of concept in those areas, then you start to look at the, the next phase and, and how you connect the gaps on 30A um, and connect up to 98. And one thing we found pretty interesting in some of the data is, is people tend to travel in clusters. They tend to travel from Alice Beach to Rosemary, from Inlet Beach to Rosemary. They travel from Seagrove to Seaside to Watercolor. 
there's not a whole lot of travel that goes from Inlet Beach all the way to Gulf Place or Dune Alley. You know, just on a daily basis, people don't make that trip. They do make shorter one, two, and three mile trips along that corridor. And so this plan really focuses on making those connections first. Next slide, please. We're also looking at providing separate ways and separate lanes for those other modes of travel, you know, for the golf carts, for the scooters, for the bikes, for the autonomous transit shuttles, all those different types of modes of travel that move about 15 miles an hour given their own lane. So essentially you're able to accommodate three varying levels of speed along both the 98 corridor and the 38 corridor. Next slide. This is a seaside and the proposal is to have these lanes running on the south of 30A between Seagrove Beach and Grayton. And this is something that Seaside's already looking at, potentially implementing some form of it this summer. This is something that could actually be moved forward with relatively quickly um, and relatively straightforward, which would actually have a pretty big impact in terms of getting that mode of travel off of the 30A corridor. And these are, are concepts, these are, you know, the, the drawing in the upper corner, in the upper left-hand corner is actually from Seaside Institute. Um, the, the aerial below is, is myself and, and the cross section. So this is something that can work. It's within the existing right-of-way and it could actually be implemented fairly quickly. <coughs> Next slide. We're also proposing roads. There are some roadway improvements, um, 98, the sixth landing of that corridor from Bay County over to Mac Bayou. We're also looking at a roadway parallel to 98, connecting what's known as Veterans Extension between 98 up into Chat Holly going over to Grand Boulevard. And we've also provided some volumes. Um, without getting a whole lot of technical detail, there's a, a travel demand model that we look at, and we found some pretty significant issues in the one that the transportation planning organization uses. So we've made some changes. We've added the, the St. Joe's development, or at least a portion of the St. Joe's development to that model. We've also added some additional corridors. And, and what we found is, you know, some of these roadways, there's a lot of projected traffic. Um, you know, there are two roads in particular, one I'm sure that you'll hear about tonight, um, this evening, you know, whether it's uh, the Seagrove connector, the Forest connector, essentially it's a roadway connecting US 98 and 30A. Uh, we've modeled that, we've added in Water Sound Parkway, we've added in a lot of the roads in St. Joe's. We've also added in a, a proposal that would essentially extend State Road 81 south going across the river and going to the back side of the St. Joe's development. So basically that would actually entail roughly a three mile bridge over the river um, but really it, it's intended to serve as a parallel route to US 331. Because what our data is showing is if you don't do anything, you need to eight lane that corridor in addition to basically four laning the bridge that was just widened you know, a couple of years back to four lanes. And, and so that's really what the projected future is. If nothing happens, if there is no type of gridded roadway network provided, you're gonna to continue to funnel all projects and all traffic into 331 and into 98. And I'm not sure if you've seen it yet or not. I'm sure it's coming to you at some level of discussion, but DOT wants to do a, a, you know, an elevated, basically it's called a, a SPUI or a single point urban interchange. But they wanna do basically an interchange at 331 and 98. And it's something that you're going to be seeing probably not too distant future there's been a lot of discussions about them doing one over in Panama City. If you've ever been to Capitol Circle and Thomas Hill Road up in Tallahassee, you see how they elevated Thomas Hill Road to tie into Capitol Circle. That's a single point urban interchange. That's what they're looking to do at 331 and 98. And longer term, if nothing happens, DOT will be looking to, to eight lane those roads and to control access along them. And, and I've seen it and it's happening in a lot of other communities that I work in. The DOT is basically going in there and starting to retrofit these roadways and making them little mini interstates. So that's the level of traffic and, and part of it is those are your only two roads in and out of this community for the most part other than State Road 20. Um, sir, can you talk a little bit about how the model treats seasonal demand? 
basically the, the seasonal demand is one of the factors that's looked at in the 30A. And so basically the, the 30A corridor is a special attractor. And so it has a, a certain level of factors that, that generate it, um, you know, trips to and from that corridor. But one thing we, we tried to look at in terms of the model update was travel impact year round from the development, from St. Joe's, from development that's proposed along 331 and along 98. So we're looking at some of the, the travel demand seasonally along 30A, but also some of the more permanent. Um, the model we are using is from the last long range plan update, it's a 2040 model. Um, the, the TPO is in the process of updating it. It'll be available sometime later, the end of this year. And with that, they'll have additional factors related to, to beach attractors, both along scenic 90A and 30A. They'll be able to capture even more of the tourism traffic. And also to integrate some of the cell phone data that we've been collecting into the model itself. So with that, I'll, I'll move forward to the next slide. In addition, we, you know, we spent a lot of time in Miramar and, uh, and South Walton, but we also have plans for all of Walton County. Um, everything north of the bay going all the way up to Alabama, including Defuniac, um, Paxton, and um, Freeport. So we're, we've looked at a number of roadway projects. Uh, we actually just presented last night uh, to the city council in Defuniac. And you know, there's definitely some, some questions and comments. Um, uh, on the proposals that we had here, and that's really some feedback we're looking at. So we, we, we've sort of separated those areas into two plans. One are largely along state roads or, or known improvements today, such as four-laning State Road 20, four-laning US 90, and then some other improvements. And then secondarily, we've actually developed what's known as a needs plan. So we've identified multimodal improvements, new roads, complete streets, even future rail service. Um, you know, restarting, connecting to Funiac with Tallahassee, Jacksonville, eventually over to Pensacola and New Orleans. Um, as you move forward over the next few years, uh, commissions and, and the councils in Freeport, the Funiac, will have opportunities to, to pull from this needs plan, to add to it. If there are certain projects that aren't desired today in the mobility plan, they can be moved over the needs plan. So basically think, think about it almost as a, a pool of projects you pull through, but a lot of them haven't necessarily been vetted yet. They haven't been discussed, there's still a lot of issues potentially with them. And so we, we've sort of laid that out there because really this is the first time this community's had a comprehensive plan for transportation. And really a, a holistic plan that looks at all the county and not just a special study along independent roadways, but all the county. And it's something that's gonna be modified you know, quite a bit over the next few years um, as discussions had, as designs had, as, you know, more detail gets into these projects, and then eventually these things will start to, to sort of even out and become more accepted in terms of the types of projects that are being proposed. But over the next few years, there are definitely going to be some updates and changes to these plans. Next slide. And these just zoom in more, um, break down that large area to projects both north of I-10 and south of I-10. And a lot of them are um, widening projects along state roads. A lot of these, several of these have already been identified in the TPO's long range plan. And a lot of these also include proposals to add a, a, a multi-use trail along all these corridors to help sort of build a, an overall network. Next slide. Again, we have south um, where we're sitting this evening uh, proposals for, for eventually the, the six laning of 331, uh, the four laning of State Road 20, the adding of multimodal lanes on State Road 20 within the Freeport area, and also the upgrade and the extension of uh, State Road 81. Something really quick about 20, I just want to, um, DOT picked up our multimodal, I mean our um, multi-use path concept on 20 really based on preliminary mobility plan work and a letter we sent based on the mobility plan. So even before the plan's adopted, we've already effected some change in terms of what DOT provides. So in other words, we're telling them, you know, what the community would like to see rather than them just telling us. Um, so already, you know, a success. 
Uh, next slide. And this sort of zooms in a little bit more, the, the, the needs plan part of it. And it's looking at some roadways around the FUNIAC and also um, adding bike lanes and sidewalks to the core part of the city. Next slide. Um, it may not be known, but the, the county actually has activ activity center policies and a whole 331 strategic master plan going all the way from the, the bay up to Interstate 10. And there's a little potential for a lot of development that can occur. And so one of the things that we've proposed is starting to build some of that gridded roadway network. But this network would actually be built by development as it comes in, as opposed to necessarily being built by the county. But really, it's to get a, a better foothold over how future development's accommodated, rather than just sort of looking at it as a project by project approach. Next slide. This gets a little bit into the mobility fee portion of it, but essentially the, one of the requirements of, of any mobility fee or any exaction um, from development is where the money's paid from or where the money's taken from a developer, it has to actually be spent in that area. And this is what's known as the, the dual rational nexus test. So the, all, that, all those plans, that meets the first part of the test. It demonstrates there's a need for improvements and what those improvements are. The second part of that test is where money is paid is where it's spent. So we've used the county's existing planning areas as a basis for this. So there's one proposed for, for South Walton, south of the bay, for Central, which is largely the, the Freeport area, uh, North Central, which is the southern part of Dufuniac and the northern part, and then north of uh, Dufuniac Springs. So essentially, in those, those colored areas that you see there, if you have a project that comes in along State Road 20 and they pay money through a mobility fee, that mobility fee has to be spent in this area. If you pay down in South Walton, it has to be spent in South Walton. If you pay in Defuniac, it has to be paid in Defuniac. So you can't take money from one area of the community and spend it in the other. You actually have to do that, and you also have to spend it on the plan. And the other component of that, um, if Walton County is not a charter county, you know, I'm not sure how familiar you are or aren't with that term, but essentially the, the county commission can't compel the cities to collect a fee. They can basically ask the cities if they want to be part of the system. Um, a lot of the communities I work in, Alachua, Seminole, Palm Beach, they're all charter counties where the county can actually tell the cities, you're collecting the fee for us. Um, and, you know, whether you do or don't like it, you know, the, the, I work for, for both counties and cities, and there's some cities fighting back because they want to have the ability to prioritize and control those funds. So if any of the cities actually opted in, they would have their own district as well. So if, you know, again, the city of Defuniac was part of this and somebody paid a fee downtown, you can't then go take that money and go spend it on South 331 outside of the city limits. It'd have to actually be spent in the city itself. Likewise, in Freeport, if they opted in, it'd have to be spent in Freeport. And then the, the county, because they're both part of a larger planning area, the county could spend mobility fee money in those cities because a, a you know, home out in the suburbs going to the Funiac does have some impact. So the county could actually use that to help improve projects both in the Funiac Springs uh, and the city of Freeport. And these also have another factor, and the next slide will show it. We actually varied the mobility fee based on area. Next slide. Oh, I actually covered that already, so next slide. So all this work is basically led up to, you know, one of the outputs is a mobility fee. And it varies. It's highest in South Walton. It's a little bit lower where we're at tonight in Central Walton. And then in North and North Central, it's the lowest. Part of that is because of need. There's a lot of need in South Walton. Um, in Central Walton, there's a lot of projected growth and there's going to be a lot of need. And in North and North Central, a lot of those projects initially are state roads. So this is sort of paying for either a portion of those state roads or also allowing the, the city to have some funds to put sidewalks, trails, or to coordinate with DOT uh, to help match those projects and move them forward. 
So, you know, the way it happens today, you have a, a subdivision that comes in on State Road 20, and they have a, an engineer, and it comes in and talks to the, the county's engineer and the city's engineer. They put together a methodology. They run a trip generation. They distribute their traffic on the network, and they figure out, is a road over capacity, or does it have plenty of capacity to handle my traffic? If it doesn't have any capacity, they go through a whole other complication called proportionate share that figures out what their share of their impact is. The mobility fee, it, it's right here. So you're you know, a single family home and you're 2,000 square feet, you pay $2,500 in South Walton. Now you come in and you do one of these large vacation rentals where basically as in terms of the mobility fee, we're treating them like a hotel in terms of impact. So they come in there and they have eight rooms, 10 rooms, you know, they're gonna pay $19,000. So in the, the next slide, uh, Rachel, if you go down to that one. We also look at some of the things that generate a lot of traffic like drive-throughs, like ATMs, fast food. And again, if you have any one of those features and you generate a lot of traffic, you're gonna pay the fee. So if you happen to be a, um, I guess it's a Tom Thumb up here, um, but you know, you come in, you have a 4,000 square foot retail building, you pay 4,000 square foot of retail, and then if you happen to have 10 gas pumps, you're gonna pay $7,000 per pump. So you're gonna pay $70,000. If you have 20 pumps, you're gonna pay $140,000. So the mobility fee schedule is really tiered towards getting at the impact of high generating uses that generate a lot of traffic and they have a big impact to the system and they're gonna pay. Now what happens today is say that same gas station goes along 98. If it's over capacity, they don't owe anything. If it's under capacity, they don't owe anything. You may have a project on either side of 30A, you know, in Gulf Place, one side's on the east side of 393, one's on the west. If there's a whole bunch of reserve trips or ghost trips on the one side of the roadway, and you know this developer has a really good engineer and they send their traffic all over the place, you know, there's a good chance that one developer, even though they're on opposite sides of the street, would have to pay money to the county, the other one wouldn't have to pay. And so it's become a, such a system that's you know convoluted and, and part of the stuff I do in South Tampa and South Florida is work for developers. And I do these traffic studies. And if I came up here and, and I did a traffic study in Walton County, there's a lot of ways you can get around it and show your development has no impact at all. It doesn't have to pay a penny. So one thing the mobility fee does is it treats all new development the same, really regardless of where you are, and says you're gonna pay some share for your impact. And that's really not what's occurring um, today. Next slide, please. And so the practical reality of, you know, all right, well, this is great. We've discussed a lot of it. It's going to be 20 years in the future. Nothing's going to happen. Kristen already alluded to a little bit. We've been talking with DOT on State Road 20, and they're going to change their cross-section in terms of what they provide there. Um, DOT has a proposal to replace one of the bridges across, or actually believe both of the bridges across Western Lake. And so the, the section you see in white was what DOT proposed two 12-foot travel lanes, two 8-foot shoulders. Well, part of the county's mobility plan is to provide these multimodal lanes on the south side of 30A to accommodate autonomous vehicles, golf carts, bikes, and, and scooters. And in reality, what it's doing is it's adding about 12 feet of width to that bridge. So this is a real opportunity to coordinate with DOT when they're already doing a project to integrate the mobility plan. So you get them to build this improvement up front, and then the county will use the mobility fee or some other funding sources to pay for their share of it. And, and so that's really one of the benefits of having this plan in place is you know DOT does a lot of work. They do a lot of resurfacing projects. They do a lot of roadway widening projects in this community. And there are really are real opportunities to, to piggyback on those and get things done way before time. As opposed to the way it stands right now, the county would have to look, you know, two, three, four, five years from now 
go design the bridge, you know, permit the bridge, do all this stuff separate from a bridge that's just been built. So this is really how, you know, an example of how the mobility plan, mobility fee, from, you know, regardless of development, is a practical standpoint. So now what's going to happen is all these plans that we've shown you this evening, they're going to work their way over to the transportation planning organization. They're going to incorporate some of those into their long-range transportation plan. They're going to be part of DOT's plan in their work program. So when they're going to look at it, they're going to say, well, what does Walton County have? Right now it has nothing. If you look, Walton County has no proposals other than you know, Kristen or Chance or somebody from the county going over there and asking DOT to do something. But there's nothing shown on any plan. Now you're actually going to have a, a whole list of projects. And you have your legislature coming in and say, well, hey, the governor's doing a stimulus package, or you have this you know, $1.9 billion stimulus package out there today. The people that are successful are the ones that have plans. The project that I did in, in Alachua County, you know, good 30% of that plan, 50% of it's built in 10 years. A good, um, you know, half of that, 30% of it was actually funded through earmarks, appropriations, federal funds, had nothing to do with developers. Had no funding anywhere on the horizon, but it was on a plan. Money became available, it was coordinated as part of a project, it got built. And, and so these things have real world implications and it's also a tool for your, for your staff to go and talk with DOT, to talk with others, uh, to say this is what we'd like to see in our community. Next slide. Really summary, we sort of laid out a lot, basically two years worth of planning in the presentation tonight. Uh, we are looking out the next 20 years for how you're gonna move around in this community. This is really the first step. Each year, the county commission, through its priority uh, budget process, will further prioritize all these projects. The TPO, the FDOT, as they go into their work programs, they'll further prioritize those. Then you'll actually have neighborhood workshops to talk about the design of these projects. So really, we're, we're at the beginning steps of a, a multi-stage process. Um, initially, these plans will be looked at every three years. Eventually, you know, longer term, you'll be able to spread out a little bit more. Uh, the mobility fee itself is based on the projects that are in the plan. It's a pretty open, pretty transparent process of how it was determined and what it is. And it is intended to replace concurrency and prop share. Next slide. So we're gonna continue to solicit public input. We're gonna continue to, to work with the municipalities, uh, Paxton, Defuniac, and Freeport. To, to get their input on the plan. Uh, we will be in the process of, of finalizing this, finalizing the tech report and the ordinance. And as of right now, there's a first reading scheduled before the Board of County Commissioners on April 27th. Um, if the board gives us any directions to make changes, we'll do that. And then we're looking to go back to the board in May for, for an adoption hearing and second reading. Next slide. Essentially what I request this evening is to recommend that the Walton County Board of County Commissioners move forward with the adoption of a mobility plan and mobility fee, plus what other other changes the uh, Planning Commission would like to add or recommendations. And with that concludes my presentation. And I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Board got any questions? I have one. Um, in the beginning of it, you said the, the, this mobility plan is gonna cost, what, $700 million? Where is the majority of that money spent? Is it on the bridge, on the east well, end of the county? There's, a, there's actually 220 projects that comprise that number, and, and honestly, they're all over. You know, I mean, you so that's this, everything that's in the plan. That's everything in the plan. Okay. That, that, okay. that is everything. That's not just South Walton. That's everything in the plan. That's uh, the four laning of 331. That's the bike lanes down on 98. That's uh, improvements on State Road 20, so that, you know, a good chunk of that, uh, I'd say probably half of it is likely gonna be funded by the state yeah, on the okay. state road system. So, you know, you're, you're talking more like $350 million. Another part of that will come from other revenue sources, some from development, but, you know, overall, there's still a lot of need in this community. And, you know, you're, you're competing against other communities. Um, you know, the perfect example is the, uh, the golf cart underpass at 98 and 30A. 
really wasn't on anybody's radar plan, wasn't on any adopted plans. Um, there was some discussion about it. Walton County came to the table with money with DOT. DOT matched some of those funds. And it's under construction. You know, and that's part of the way some of these things work is you know, just like the, the Western Lake Bridge. You have some money that you can bring to the table, you can get these things actually implemented fairly quickly. How much of um, the fees that you were speaking of, how much of that, do you, do you have a projection of what that would collect? Well, we, we did a real with a number on what the fees are, so I assume you got some kind of numbers well, on what that would add. We're, we're looking at those. We did a real quick one on St. Joe's. So, so St. Joe's, the way it's structured right now, that they're not paying anything. Um, you know, the, I believe subsequent phases in the future have to look at traffic of a portion of the share. But we ran the numbers, and it'd be roughly eighty-one million dollars. Just off the housing, just, just residential St. Joe's, housing. Just off the housing in St. Joe's. That just residential housing. Residential, and I think some of the, the retail as well. Okay. Just resident. Okay. Just residential. So there's still commercial and other things that would be added to that based on their fees too. Correct. Correct. So it, it's a you know it can add up pretty significantly. Again, it's not going to be able to fund you know 200 300 million dollars, but it could fund a good chunk of it. Um, and again, when you know if the commission in the future were to go to look out to do an infrastructure sales tax or do some other type of request before the the, the residents. What I found in all the communities I work in, if, if local governments aren't requiring development to mitigate their impact, there's a lot of citizens that come out in opposition to any type of new funding source. Where local governments are requiring developments to do their share of it, and they actually have a plan or projects to be held accountable to, those sales tax actually have been fairly successful. Uh, and, that, and that's repeated, you know, where I spent a lot of my time in Alachua County, they didn't do either one of those, and it's failed four times. Why didn't they, do it? they didn't have the plan, and you know, for now that now they have it, they have the development mitigation part of it, but they didn't have the planning component side of it, and they've gone four times, and it's failed four times. Oh, okay. Vol Volusia, Volusia County, it failed this past year. Uh, it's failed in Osceola a few years back, so. Uh, Rosa's just failed like last year because the citizens said there was no developer contribution and they also didn't have a really good plan so that's a really close by recent example mm -hmm. now, I know when we did our sales tax on the bridge we had a pretty good plan on that it had a sunset on it yep. had a specific uh, cost of what it was going to mm -hmm. uh, that way money couldn't be spent in other areas they knew exactly where the money was going and when that when that money was collected the tax sunsetted and that was it yep. in, in, in communities that have done that have found a lot of success doing just that and then they've been able to go out in the future and do it again because they've delivered the ones that haven't done the planning and haven't required other developments to, to mitigate it you know I mean it's all across the state you know it's pretty you know Pretty standard in terms of how, how these things become successful and, and how they don't. Mr. Coaston, you had a question? For the people who live and work here every day, established full time residents of Walton County, how will that affect our bottom line? The the sales tax? The the funding for the mobility plan. The fee the fee base? The, the, the fee base the mobility fee itself is not assessed on existing residents. It's not a tax, so Unless you're building a home, or you're expanding a business, or building a business, or you're building a you know a new car wash or drive-through, anything new you would pay. But if you're an existing resident and you're just living in your home, your existing business, you're just operating it, you would not pay the mobility fee at all. Thank That's you. not assessed. It's only assessed on new development. Thank, Thank you. you. That's a, definitely a good point to make. Uh, Commissioner Perry uh, touched on uh, what my question would be about. Are there any triggers for this to sunset or to end at any point in time? If you build all the projects. Yeah. Um, you, you know, in reality, what I found is that there's always going to be need. If you're a growing community, whether it's a sidewalk, a bike lane, a trail, there's always going to be something. Um, I don't know of anybody that's caught up. 
yet. Um, you know, because you continue to have development and continue to move forward. So maybe eventually, um, but you know, not anytime soon. So basically, the fees are going to continue until all the projects are done. They will, and by, by statute, they're actually required to be based on the, the most recent localized data. So typically, every three to five years, they're also looked at to see if the underlying plans have changed, to see if any of the factors that were used to calculate it have changed. So this is something that you know every few years will be we looked at again um, and make sure that it's kind of keeping up with the plan. But you know these tend to be sort of a first iteration, and then they tend to, to gradually increase over time. I would think if you're going to use it for a sales tax or use a sales tax to get money, you would specifically designate projects that you were looking at to be done. And then when those projects are finished, you sunset those. And if you want to add to it later on, you come back and, and um, have the people vote on it again because the sales tax has to be voted on. It, it, it does. And, and really, that's a whole separate discussion. That would be a, you know something that the board has not decided on either way. But... A lot of local governments have used these mobility plans as the basis for going after an infrastructure sales tax and pulling projects out of that and saying, this is what we intend to, to fund and build um, should the residents of the community vote for it. Um, I certainly had some questions when I was reading the material and going to some of the other presentations about whether some of this could be done in the time frame that's really said. If we were to go ahead and approve this and it proves not to be true, what's the, how do you modify, you, what, you have to wait every three years to modify the plan? It doesn't work, so here we are stuck? I mean, how, how no, is No, uh, essentially, I mean, statute, basically the, the plans, it's a living document. So, I mean, the Board of County Commissioners could make a proposal at any time to update the plan or update the fee that there's no limit on it but you know generally they tend to let them you know sit for a few years to see how they actually do but if there is a big change you know they can amend it at any time uh, through a public hearing process and through a modification of the ordinance so there there is certainly a public perception out there that that um, that uh, uh, Home builders and developers who create product for primary residents and business owners who service primary residents are going to be paying a fee where a large portion of the of the projects and the fees are actually going to be used to move tourists, not residents. Can you address any type of methodology or modeling that you use that, that could help those folks understand that um, yeah, uh, a little more fair than just... Uh, just uh, moving tourists. Is. Uh, essentially, in South Walton, I think we assume 50% of the costs would be funded by other sources. In Central Area, we have 75%, and in North Walton, it's 90%. So the development's paying. You know, that's why you see it's, uh, it's lowest in Defuniac, and it start, starts to get gradually higher. We've assumed a lot of other funding sources were going to be available. Um, so development certainly isn't going to be paying the full cost of this mobility plan. Um, you know, one of the things we had done really early on back in December, we had kind of put together a really quick fee, and we had a couple of different funding tiers on that, and uh, it definitely raised some eyebrows because you know the fees are pretty high because they weren't they didn't assume any funding at all is available. Um, so really, you know, in large part that would be tourism, that would be DOT, that would be other dollars, and. and I think you know the the bridge example on 331. I think a large portion of that was paid by tourists, and, and that's what most communities find, especially tourism communities. 60, 70 percent of the sales tax is actually paid from people coming into this community, and and you're not capturing any of that other than the tourist development tax today. Um, and you know, given how many tourists you do have coming in here, it'd be definitely something that would you know lower the impact on existing residents and actually generate some you know pretty substantial revenue sources was that did did that make sense so the fee is only a small portion of the projects that mm -hmm. that the new developments paying so you know the other funding sort you know that I just want to make that really clear because I've heard that too mm -hmm. um, and you know 
the tourist and the sales tax and you know the other revenue sources would have to make up the rest really for this to be successful so um, the new development are the new permanent residents so what you're really doing is asking them to contribute to the new permanent population growth component of these projects yeah, if I remember correctly, I think on the bridge the estimate was somewhere between 70 to 80 percent of that was paid by tourists coming in on a half cent sales tax. Yeah, it, it, it can generate quite a bit of revenue fairly quickly. I guess one, one last question may be obvious, but did, do your models account for what the surrounding counties are doing as well in terms of their infrastructure and roadway plans, like St. Joe going to Ebro? Or, you know, well, that was part of the issue. The model that we inherited and looked at didn't have any of that in there. So we, we've actually added that in there, and that, that's part of the, the impact. And, and, you know, Chris and I have had a lot of discussions about, you know, a lot of other communities as they're growing sort of have ongoing people and consultants available that sort of keep up with those models to do just that, make sure that you're capturing Okaloosa, make sure you're capturing Bay County, make sure that you're even capturing the development that's occurring internal to your community. And so I'd say that the, the model that was pre this mobility plan was not capturing it. Um, the, the changes that we've made, we've captured quite a bit of it coming out of Bay County. I'm very pro mobility plan, but, and I'm not trying to shoot holes in anything, um, one of the concerns is um, it costs 10 times more money, taxpayers' money, to retrofit development with infrastructure. So what, um, what, the, what we've gotten caught in is that infrastructure is constantly being, playing catch up with development. And if you gotta dig up roads and sidewalks, uh, especially these brand new roads that are increasing our mobility, uh, to put down um, infrastructure, uh, sewage treatment, to try and get rid of all these antiquated septic tanks that's not doing anything for our aquifer or, or the bay or any of the tributaries. Walton County is spiderwebbed with creeks, rivers, and tributaries and rivers. Um, it's not just the bay. It's all over Walton County. How do we uh, keep from, th does any of this allow for um, before you make new roads and make all these improvements that the infrastructure is under there so it doesn't have to be dug up and replaced. Okay. And I'm going to give you the planning speech now because you just asked me for it. So um, <laughs> everybody get ready. I know everybody's heard my planning speech before, but this is what true planning is. You know, just because we don't show road and pro projects or projects on a long range plan like this doesn't mean that they don't happen. They happen in a chaotic, expensive, retrofit, you know, crazy way when we don't plan. Does that, I mean, what you're saying is exactly what the issue is and why successful communities do planning. Because when you plan, the development falls in line with the plan, the infrastructure projects fall in line with the plan, and it happens in a coordinated way instead of an expensive, chaotic way where we're digging stuff up or, you know, we've got, you know, one engineering project over here, another one over here, you know, things aren't matching up. You know, that is true urban planning. That is the planning function of local government. And so, you know, thanks for letting me do the planning speech because this is really Okay. Is what it's about. Okay. Well, I base my question on what I see and what I've seen in history and how we've done in the past. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping. That's right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Things happen in a in planning school. We have a whole class called planning theory, and planning theory is about just that. It's about how things happen when we don't have you know rational models or we don't have you know uh, long range plans to look at. They happen in a real expensive way, to be honest with you. So planning helps us be financially successful. It helps us save money, help us save taxpayer money, um, and it also helps us um, capture all of the revenue sources that are available to us from other places. So perfect, perfect segue into planning.
since I rode the short bus, I wanted to hear. <laughs> okay, cl cl clarify this for me. All these new roads and sidewalks and development and everything that you're talking about right now, the infrastructure is going to be there under the ground. That's all part of the plan. Is it's that all what part you're of telling the plan. me? Yeah, I mean, and you know, as the development comes online, if we have a plan in place, that development meets our plan. You know, we're not going back in and retrofitting the development to suit the to suit the the, the needs that happen. That is the chaos model. You know, where you're going in and you're doing things. You know, after the fact, and it's expensive. Um, so that's what we're trying to not to do here with our first long range plan. And um, you know, I know it's scary to see forty, you know, tw this many projects on a map, and it's just you know your mind is blown. And you know, we you know we don't need that or you know whatever. But um, just remember that things, if we're, they're not planned for, it doesn't mean that they won't happen. They just are going to happen in a more expensive, more chaotic way. Makes sense. I do have a question before you walk away about short-term things. This is a longer-term plan. Mr. Galloway, for example, had a short-term plan. Does, should those people or those things be coming to the planning department? Yeah, well, just this particular proposal, because it was is golf cart oriented, and I didn't mean to be... Uh, no, you're you not. Know, I'm just... We were 30 uh, minutes into this meeting, and I really need to get this other, plan done. Or there may be some oh, other forgot things about. <laughs> that short-term, not... In yeah, the long yeah. Term. So, so we are, that? you know, the TDC is doing some things right now, short term. Seaside is doing things short term. So there are some things going on on the corridor, uh, short term right now. And you know, his idea, maybe something that we can look at. But right now, with the infrastructure situation that we have on 38, I'm not sure that inducing more golf cart demand is going to be something that is good just right now. Oh. Yeah, um, from personal experience. We would have to really look at that. Tonight, that it yeah. Is not what you want. yeah, I mean, <laughs> and it's not to say that, and, and I think actually, when if the mobility plan is successful, it would fit perfectly. It'd be great. I mean, that's exactly what we want. We want, you know, other modes, and we want technology, and we want all of those things. Um, but right now, we would have to really look at, you know, is adding more golf carts onto the road a good idea, and would that reduce our traffic uh, scenario? Especially in a, a fee base, and I don't think all yeah. it was just just yeah. golf carts. I think he had some other stuff. Yeah, there, yeah, so. yeah. You know, and it, he's right though. Ride share has been looked at a lot by uh, transportation professionals, and those are still people in cars. You know, so they're still you know even like Uber or Lyft. They're still it's still a vehicle. It, so when our model looks at a Uber, it's no different than if it's your personal car. I mean, it's a you know it's a <coughs> car on the road. So what do you want the planning board to do right now? What's the what's our well, next? Well, you got to listen to the public. Yeah, we're gonna <laughs> oh, pub, yeah. we got okay. our public comments first. Okay. Have, they, have, have, have these all the questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, we're going to take five minutes for a break, real quick, <laughs> and then we'll come back. We're going to open up to public comments, if that's what you mean. Once the staff uh, of the, the commissioners have finished asking all their questions of the applicant, we will open it up to public comments and and questions. Yes, yeah, you, yeah. You don't have to ask, you don't have to make a comment if you don't. You can just ask a question. <laughs> no, I have questions about this topic. Sure. Yeah. No, no, no. That's fine. Yeah, we're going to open up to public. Com you you can ask questions, make comments, whatever you want to do on that. Yes, ma'am. I might. It depends on how busy we get. Right. We've got a bunch of people on Zoom. It's not just the people here, right. so we'll open it up to Zoom too. And what I don't want to do, what I will ask is, and I'll I'll make this comment. We don't want repeat questions or. We don't want repeat comments. Right. If somebody's got something new to say, we want to hear it. But if it's not, then we don't want to hear the same thing over and over again. Right. But yeah, if you've got something to say, um, I and was hoping um, I have something to like, may I approach it? Sure. Uh, um, I have a question about the long term vision. Okay. okay.
those are questions for him too. Oh, so, I, I know. yeah, we'll but we'll get him to answer. Yeah, you, you'll ask yeah, the question. Yeah. Well, that's fine. We want to try to give everybody the opportunity to say what they want to. We don't want it to get to just be too long and too laborious if we, because everybody's going to get tired after a while, especially if we're hearing the same things. But if we, anything new, we want to encourage people to stay because we, we want to get it all out. And make. No, I'm okay, thank goodness. <laughs> uh huh. Mm hmm. Sure. So one of my thoughts is can the planning commission be reasoned about and make a recommendation or Yeah, we can make that recommendation. No, right? We can make that recommendation. Bring it up when you when you talk and that way we'll have it on the record. Joined by a group. Is that legal? Find out. That's what I understand. He had surgery. Apparently he used to lift weights a lot back in the day and something just gave out. Um, oh, that's why.
doing this while we have our break. Okay, we'll go ahead and bring the uh, meeting back to order, if you don't mind. Hello, Gavin. You ready? Karen, you ready? All right. Hey, if y'all don't mind, we're bringing the meeting back to order. Let's see. I think we still had. Uh, was uh, are the commissioners? Y'all have any more questions of the applicant and staff? Y'all good? Okay. Then we'll open it up to public comments. Um, I don't have a sign-in sheet tonight. So how many? Who in the audience would like to speak? Okay. Well, <laughs> Miss McQuiston, would you like to start? you That's fine. You can ask questions. Please state your name, though, for the record, so she'll... Bonnie McQuiston. You might want to spell the last name. M-C-Q-U-I-S-T-O-N. Thank you. I hope, is somebody paying? Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, she's Sorry, I just... <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so it, ap it appears to me that this plan changes the entire character of 30A. I'll just say that's a comment, changes the entire thing. So my question is, on those... Uh, Pat, can I a turn ask him? Oh, I'll ask him. Ask us, and then he'll he can ask. Yeah. Uh, on the path, the path is that a uh, path that's going to have uh, the autonomous vehicles, the golf carts, the scooters, and the bikes, all on the same one. I'm assuming that's from. Is it the same path? And will it take the place of the of the bike path now? I mean, is it are all those vehicle things going to be on the same uh, in the same lane? What? Don't we have a slide that shows this? But they'll all be all they'll all be using sharing the same path. It's then, important so. to understand though that that typical segment changes throughout the corridor. So it's not one one typical throughout the corridor because each of our unique communities like Rosemary, Alice, Seaside, it's it has to be a different look through those communities, through different areas where the right of way narrows. So it's not, you know, one consistent segment. There, there, that's just w would not be possible um, without destroying the sense of place and uniqueness that really is um, important on our uh, on 30A. Yeah, and C Kristen's right. I mean, w we actually have I think there's at the last count there's 14 different sections for 30A, and other ones that one just happens to be sort of combined. But the other ones, one of the feedback we got from the communities is they like to have separation between each of them. So you have, you know, the plan also proposes to put an eight foot path on both sides of 30A for the entire corridor, then have landscape buffer between that and these multimodal paths, and then another buffer between that and the travel lanes. So some areas we have 50 foot of right of way, other areas we have 110 foot of right of way. So really the, the cross section changes over the whole corridor. 
honestly, we really got into the weeds on 30A, and, and we don't really need to at this level. I think what's important is that, you know, we know that the corridor, that the, the goal of the corridor is to be multimodal and not to be widened car travel lanes. That's, that's the important thing to really decide today. Um, and then as we get into future visualization, future engineering, future design, um, we're not going to do anything without good visualization. This is something that is my next step if we get through this planning process at, for the 30A corridor is to have everybody see in a highly graphic visual way. Right now we only have one good graphic for Seaside. We need that for everywhere uh, to really move um, and to have true public buy-in. We would have to all accept uh, the design for the entire corridor. Okay. Well, I know that people come here for the beach. They come here for 30A, and it's quaint, the quaint little different villages up and down 30A, the quaintness of it. It isn't Panama City Beach. It isn't Destin. It's quaint. And we have a lot of green space, state land, and people come here because we do have beach. This is what makes us special. So I, I would hate to see the character of 30A changed um, the way it appears that it, it, it does on the plan. So I noticed that the name, <clears throat> the name of the uh, consulting group is, is it New Urban, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. New Urban. And so I, I looked up urban, urbanism, and um, I know that Seaside has been, you know, preaching new urbanism for years, but it, it said this is the main focus, and you said the main goal, is taking automobiles off of the roads. You're encouraging walking, biking, other modes of transportation, mass transit, taking cars off the roads. But uh, I challenge the premise that building another road will take care, will take cars off of 30A. I, I don't. I think that it just eliminates. It doesn't belong there. P building a road to me doesn't fit in with. Hey, we're doing this to take automobiles off the roads. We're encouraging other modes of transportation, but we're going to build a road which is for automobiles, uh, and where you want to build the road, I challenge uh, that the county does not own that property. That is owned by the people of the state of Florida. It was bought by the state of Florida for the public, for the state of Florida, for people to enjoy recreation. And, uh, um, it, and so I question why that road, I just have to say, why is that road in your plan when it, it is not, that land is not owned by the county? We don't plan things on other people's property. That That is the state's property. And it just doesn't fit. To me, that road, I'm asking that road be removed. That forest road that they want to put through the biggest section of Point Royal State uh, uh, Forest, that that doesn't need to be split and fragmented with a road. And I have to ask just why is it there when we're trying to take automobiles off the roads? Okay. Now, Point Washington State Forest was purchased in 1992 for all the people of Florida for preservation. Since that purchase, we've had to be constantly vigilant. First the developers came for it, and then the county has come for it again and again and again. And each time we have to wage a defense for our state forest, for our state land, to keep it. It is you know, when you see that seal behind you, the great seal of Walton County says, pride, preservation, conservation, and I asked the commissioners the other day, if you don't preserve and conserve Point Washington State Forest and our Grayton Beach Park and Deer Lake State Park, and if you don't preserve what we have now, what is there to conserve and preserve? I mean, that's what we have. That's all we have to conserve. That's all that's going to be green because he did say he's right. Everything on 98 on the north side is, is for sale. It's going to all be developed. It's going to all be developed. The only green we'll have left is the state land. And so, you know, I would say, you know, add a lane to every existing connector road we have now. Add a lane if you need to have traffic flow north. Um, mainly, a new road, anywhere, any road, it's going to bring people to 30A. If it connects to 30A, that's where everybody, that's the destination, 30A. And when they get on 30A, they stay on 30A. They're cruising right now, down there. I bet you can't go down 30A. They're cruising up and down 30A. And all roads lead to Seaside because that's where everybody wants to go. And that's really where our main problem has always been. Um, 
And I, someone has mentioned safety at this road. Now, I talked to the fire chief this morning. They are looking at building a fire station right up there uh, between the St. Joe property and the uh, industrial park, which would serve that area. They need to look at that because that's where it's going to be so much uh, St. Joe development. I would just say that more people have invested their life savings in South Walton property. I mean, I'm sorry, many, many people have invested their life savings in South Walton property, and many of these are adjacent to or close to the state land. We want to maintain some quality of life here, which is a challenge when the county's entire focus has been on tourism and development, development, development. Uh, giving up preservation land for a road will set a precedent. Lee, you mentioned you didn't want to set a precedent here with something tonight. We don't need to set a precedent using our state land for development, and a road is development. Um, it, our Point Washington State Forest is the heart of South Walton. It is where all of our wildlife has been pushed to with all the development and will continue to be. A road is incompatible with conservation and preservation. We need to protect our forest for future generations because this is all we have. And um, I ask you um, to please ask them to remove that road. It shouldn't be there, and it never should have been there. And thank you. Okay, I think there was a question there as to why it was added. Was that correct? Why was it added? Why was that road in there? The question was why. Did you want to answer that now? Is that well? I can answer. I mean, one of the things, first off, the, the first slide is moving people, providing choices. This isn't a plan just to take cars off the road. It's, it's a multimodal plan looking at, at all modes of travel. And the forest road's been something that's been identified for a number of years. It's on the plan. Uh, ultimately, it'll be a decision in front of the Board of County Commissioners. Um, you know, and, and there are roads that are on maps all the time and there's different ways to acquire property whether it's through the state whether it's through private property so that's really not the the limiting factor um, you know ultimately it's a policy discussion uh, that will go in front of the board as to whether or not that roadway should be there but this is a multimodal plan it's looking at all modes of travel uh, including roads and it's really trying to provide people choices and also through the mobility hubs, trying to create an environment where people will park once and use other forms of transportation um, when they get to those areas. What is the necessity of a road through the state forest in that area then? I mean, in terms of our traffic numbers, it actually you know, accommodates a fairly decent amount of, of travel uh, through that area. There's also some need in terms of, of life safety. Um, on average, between 30A West and 395, you have a road every mile and a half to two miles connecting 98 and 30A. Between 395 and Water Sound Parkway, you have an eight and a half mile segment of both 98 and 30A that you do not have a connection there. So if anything happens along that area, your only two choices are Water Sound Parkway or 395. So that, you know, as Growth and traffic continue to increase along the 30A corridor. There's also, you know, the practical sense uh, of a life safety matter. Um, but again, that's ultimately going to be a decision in front of the board. But there are, uh, there is a need for corridors. Um, if you look for, for whatever reason, whatever reason the development pattern happened that way, uh, you have more of a connected network between 395 and 30A. To the west, you don't have that same connection between Water Sound Parkway and 395. Um, and, and that's really one of the reasons that corridor is identified. Uh, it's also something that, that's been looked at for a number of years and uh, it's something that the, the commission hasn't, um, I believe they actually have it currently funded for a more detailed study right now. So that's one of the reasons that roadway is reflected in the plan. Okay. Um, I know we had a lot of people that wrote letters and everything in uh, opposition of the of the <coughs> the road that Ms. McQuiston spoke on, and there's probably several people in here that want to speak on that too. I'm going to ask that we wait till the latter part to speak on that, so we can get that all together. 
So if anybody's got anything they want to talk about other than that road, um, raise your hand. Okay. It doesn't matter. We all just come up whenever you want to. I'm going to go to Zoom after we get everybody in here. Yeah. Thank you. I will talk about the road later, but what I want to say is it's a matter of also trust. Excuse me? State your name. I'm sorry. Barbara Morano, M-O-R-A-N-O. There's a matter of trust here, and I'm going to give you an example. When this goes before the BCC, which I'm sure this will move from this, from this meeting room, is going to go to the BCC, they have tacked a public meeting onto their BCC meeting date. They didn't realize, I don't think, the scope of how important this is for public opinion and for public input. Now, if you sit at a BCC meeting, which I did today, started at nine, and it was three and a half long grueling hours, and then there was a public workshop after that. We can't expect the public to wait. They don't have a time, and they work during the day. So my recommendation, if you can make a recommendation, if this does move on to the next level, to have a different day than a BCC meeting. This is huge. I've been following this project really for two years, and there's still a lot of questions that we have, and it can't be passed through quickly on an afternoon after our commissioners are tired, after our people are tired. It needs its own day. And Mac really did suggest that on the two Mondays, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I just want to clarify that it, it won't be passed on that day. We have to have two readings of an ordinance, so that will not be the final public hearing. Um, the, there'll be another hearing in May. That's exactly why I'm saying it has to be a special day, because we need the public input to get to the second level. It just <coughs> it, it, it would be too passed over, Kristen. It's too important. You put too much work into it. You, I think you would agree you'd want a special day, and so did Mac. Thank you. We can make a recommendation during the the motion if someone makes that motion. Yes, ma'am. Anyone else want to speak? Yes, ma'am. Um, I have some questions. Um, one thing is I noticed in the uh, plan fees that it identifies rentals as being a different uh, amount and I want to know how you are going to know for sure whether something's going to be a rental or not what what you plan to use to determine that and I also want to know if you've given any consideration to uh, I, I don't like asking you all because you <laughs> you didn't do this but they'll, they'll answer I suppose I wonder if you've given any consideration to uh, people that are actually homesteaded having a different rate if they were to have to rebuild their house or something because of a storm or who knows what. I mean, I don't predict the devastating things that can happen, fires, storm, you know, hurricanes, uh, floods. I, I just, I, I'd like to understand how that would work. And then I also want to make a comment, and I'm sure I have dozens more questions, but I, let's do a few at a time. I want to make a comment about something is this looks awfully much like people who come here today or need to rebuild or need to add on to their home because maybe they bought a little bitty home and they want to you know remodel it and upgrade it a little bit but it's still the same exact people living in it um, you know why why should those people be paying for the sins of the past, so to speak. Um, Seaside is a victim of its own success. It's brought literally millions of people to this area. I believe, maybe I'm wrong, but I believe it's largely built out. And yet, you know, the rest of us and anyone new who comes in here to be a permanent resident is going to be the one stuck helping pay for what was done by people before they ever came, you know? So I, I have a little issue with the, let's call it equity of that. Um, 
then there's the things like uh, some of these kiosks and things that have been mentioned in the plans. We are already having a lot of difficulty, particularly if you look at Seaside right now, there's bicycles all over the place. I'm not anti-bicycle, not one bit. I'm anti-anything, though, that people decide to just dump wherever they feel like it, or they decide to steal somebody else's because they don't have theirs, or you know they don't have one. And I think with things like bicycles and scooters, not so much with golf carts, even though I know everybody dislikes golf carts. I think there are some things we could do with golf carts, but these smaller mobility uh, devices, they are subject to being laid all over everywhere, sidewalks, et cetera. And I don't know why we would want to have kiosks all over the place where people can just rent them anywhere. And I mean, I kind of like the idea that right now they have to get them from a bicycle shop or a, you know, if, it, if we really end up having to deal with scooters, that they have to get them from a scooter shop. And then they're responsible for making sure that those, those, those uh, particular devices get back or they get charged for them. So there, there's just things like that that I'm, I'm sure that Kristen and Jonathan probably have some answers or explanations for how that sort of thing can be contained, but I'm not seeing them right away uh, on all my comments. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. That, that micromobility is a separate ordinance that's going to come back to you in the near future. It's a separate, whole separate deal. Yeah, so we haven't gotten there yet. We need to get through this part first and then, um, but that is, he is tasked with that and has been working on that in terms of making sure they're put away and cleaned up and that they go back to a certain place and certain, that that's coming, but it's in the, micro, it's called the micro mobility ordinance that we gotta get to after we get to this, yeah. Is the west end of 30A right now let's call it from maybe Blue Mountain to, to 98, but it may be Gulf Place to 98, is way, way, way less, it's less expensive to buy. Uh, there's less, there's virtually no traffic issues unless the line, the, the line of cars to Stinkies blocks the whole road when they've got, you know, 100 more people than they can seat. Uh, and so, it sounds like the West End of 30A, even though that we do not can't command the prices, not for rental, not for purchase, uh, we don't command those prices that they do on the East End, and we don't have the problems on the East End. And I do realize that there's still developable, developable land, but most of our end is single family residential. So assuming the planning department does not see fit to give waivers and, and allow developers to have uh, zoning changes, density changes, PUDs where they're not really a PUD, they kind of make it sound like they're a PUD, but they're not really for those of us that live there. They're so they can make more money. And so if, if the rules are strictly followed, I believe the West End will see a lot less of this congestion and all that that this plan is meant to alleviate. Now, I don't, I'm not, I don't foresee the future, you know, I'm not, I don't have that talent, I only wish, but, but I just think there are things that we can look at because, again, Seaside needs this sort of thing. I don't dispute that one bit. They've been very involved since the beginning. They clearly are bought in. But why should the West End have to pay the same kind of fees to help Seaside that's already basically built out when we don't have the problems? And if anything, they could add us in later perhaps when we start having more needs for it. But, but I, don't, I don't like the idea that the West End gets stuck basically paying for a lot of the problems on the East End. Could we, uh, <clears throat> um, she, she actually raised a, a lot of good questions. Um, just quick, real quick, on, on the rental properties, I think the, the county actually has a permit process to be declared a rental, so that's how you would address that. In terms of the homesteaded property, if you have an existing home and it's damaged, the mobility fee ordinance would basically recognize 
that you had existing square footage so you wouldn't pay again if you rebuilt your home. Uh, there are some exceptions, like if you're remodeling a bathroom or expanding a bathroom or adding a garage or a kitchen where you actually wouldn't pay the mobility fee. But if you're adding bedrooms, which actually you know can potentially generate traffic, you would pay. Uh, Kristen did mention the, the bicycle, the micro-mobility, which are scooters and bikes. We are going to have an ordinance that controls those. Um, one of the things we've noticed and one of the reasons we have neighborhood mobility hubs identified is a lot of the beach access today, the bicycles are strewn everywhere. There's not enough bicycle racks to accommodate the people that want to go there. So there actually needs to be someplace that's safer, more coordinated, covered, and actually has some type of amenities that go along with that as opposed to people just stacking their bikes up there. Um, and in terms of the West End, Actually, we have a huge issue with, with parking along the 30A right-of-way, accessing the, the Dune Allen and the, the Port Panic Beach access. And one of the major proposals is to have a mobility hub at the county's property in Gulf Place and actually running a transit service between that and the beach access, um, which you know, ultimately is going to require a, a lane for whether it's a shuttle, a transit, or a golf cart taking people back and forth. But, it, but actually, that's actually one of our areas of the highest need um, that we've actually identified. We were somewhat surprised, but when, when you go out there and during the summer, you see how many people are actually out there, and the demand is, is actually all year round. It's not necessarily spiking like Seaside. It's pretty consistent demand the whole year. So I just kind of wanted to address those comments. But they're actually well, they're really good questions. <clears throat> Thank you. Anybody else want to speak? Yes, ma'am. with Dunlap and Chipman. Dunlap and Chipman represents the hammocks at Seagrove, which is down on um, 395. I know that Kristen said we're not talking about the individual properties in the plan, um, and that will come at a later date, um, but um, I am obligated to come and explain why we think a particular piece of property should not be included. I, I understand. I really do. We don't have time, so let me just go through this very quickly very quickly. The property um, in itself is, uh, has a development order on it and is not a suitable site. It's largely wetlands and is um, predominantly <coughs> going and is under development now so that it's not a site on there. This, when the original plan came out, it mentioned this particular site. It's right across the street from the hammocks at Seagrove. Um, I ha I'm just going to hand this over to whoever it's a site plan for a five-lot single-family subdivision. Um, that's on this particular property. As I said, the developer is working now to develop the site. The county commission, um, ahead of the game, before you guys even are at this level, asked them to, um, the TDC, to look at the property, so they are. So I'm running into that right now, and I'm trying to speed it along because you guys got a lot more to talk about is a, a 2018 analysis the South Mountain Community Council had done in order to get a light at 395 and 30A. In particular, it talks about crashes along 395 that, re that preempted getting a light there. <clears throat> the most important thing to look on that is that the site right there at, at Hammocks at Seagrove <laughs> and north of that just slightly at um, Watercolor were the most incidences. And that's exactly where that particular property is if there was a garage there. So it doesn't seem suitable for traffic purposes to have that there. And that was the majority of what we wanted to talk about. The plan that we ha that's on the county's website mentions the Seagrove uh, vicinity um, on 395 and 30A, and it specifically calls it a community hub, and that community hub would have a uh, vehicle parking. The report, um, I think it was page 13 of the report, mentions that the parking and mobility hub would include, it's severely impacted by wetlands, so the important thing they wanted to mention in the report was to include a garage, a parking garage, and that is exactly what the community does not want. That's what I am he here to say. We're actually <coughs> requesting that they take it out of the It's not out in of the there. Scope. That's an old document. It's not in your it's current. It's on the most latest one. I apologize, and I'm done. Thank you yeah, very much. It's not in what that you guys come up are later, considering it? tonight. Yeah. yeah, that'll come up at a later time, so we'll, we'll address that later. Anybody else in here would like to speak on it? Yes, sir. Come on. You're the, you're the last one in here that wants to speak, I believe. 
and we'll go to the Zoom. So um, I. You're not gonna read all that, are you? Oh no no no! I, I have nothing. Noth <laughs> this is actually just my just my folder in case anyone has questions. I, I have nothing important here. This is actually for a park game in contest the city of Niceville. It's a. Um, I'm Michael Panarisi, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-P-A-N-A-R-I-S-I. -I. I'm a resident of Niceville, Florida. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's the, not the easiest last name to learn. Um, I'm a resident of Niceville, Florida, and I'm, I came here for a different reason. However, I am I'm here to speak about a, a concern that I've had involving US-98 and this plan. I also have a second concern that involves bicycles. My main concern involving US-98 is the travel time that this plan may, may have on east-west travel between Sandestin and Panama City Beach. Right now it's 45 to 65 miles per hour with limited traffic signals and you're able to get through there very quickly. However, future developments may force 40 to 45 with stoplights and six lanes and that's currently the case in Destin. You've seen in the news many times uh, bicycle or pedestrian hit by a uh, hit by car at a major intersection. Are there plans um, either for this to be addressed for um, U.S. Route 98 to I'm trying to figure out how I can put this n not be severely impacted by developments whilst also increasing the safety of bicyclists and pedestrians in relation to this plan? Uh, that's actually a real good question, and we actually have um, trails proposed along, separated from US 98 along both sides of that corridor, and we are in discussions with DOT about different design standards for separated micro-mobility and separated pathways along the whole corridor, and in the plan itself, especially within the Sandestin Miramar Beach area, has a healthy emphasis on making it safer for people walking and biking. So yeah, definitely keep people off of 98 that aren't cars. Okay, thank you. Um, my second concern um, also involved capacity of bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, many European cities that have done similar aspects of this, uh, they're completely different, but uh, similar on, on the idea of bicyclists and pedestrian micromobility, um, have run into many problems where bicycle congestion and pedestrian congestion is worse than motor vehicle congestion does that concern Walton County in any way where that could occur? I've seen it happen before. I just didn't know if that was a concern of Walton County or not. Yes. Um, well, if we ever get like Copenhagen or Amsterdam, that'd actually probably be a, a pretty good thing. Um, parts of 90A or parts of 30A and scenic 98 can actually have a pretty significant amount of traffic, a bicycle pedestrian traffic on the pathways, which is one reason why we're proposing to widen the trail along Scenic 98, and then provide a separate path for electric bikes and scooters on the roadway. And then on 30A, we're proposing to have paths on both sides of the entire corridor, and then separated facilities for the bikes and the scooters. So in reality, we're providing quite a bit of infrastructure to ha hopefully safely move all those. I um, mean, ultimately, if you have that many bicyclists as you do with some of the European cities, you know, maybe they eventually, you know, take over some of the car lanes, but uh, I think we're still a little bit of a way of, away from there. But we are planning on providing facilities for that okay. significant demand. All right, thank you so much. Um, just, minor, just some minor concerns that I've had listening to this presentation. Uh, thank you so much, and you'll have a great day. Thank you. And I think that's um, everybody in here. I wanted to shout out Scott from Old Harbor. Can we get that? You'll need to come up to the microphone. Okay, uh, my name is Dave Clausen, C-L-A-U-S-E-N. Uh, I'm a resident of Santa Rosa Beach, and I'm also uh, president of the Choctahatchee Audubon Society, uh, and we cover uh, Okaloosa and Walton counties. We presently have 279 members, and uh, 65 of them live in Walton County. And as you probably know, uh, uh, Choctahatchee Audubon is a local chapter of the National Audubon Society one of the nation's oldest uh, conservation organizations. Uh, while I, I personally agree with some of the alternatives in the mobility plan, <clears throat> uh, and certainly we all want to reduce traffic on 30A, however, Choctahatchee uh, Audubon is strongly opposed 
to two of the uh, transportation corridors uh, that in various forms are called roads, trails, lanes, or ways in the mobility plan. And uh, these two routes, uh, and one of them is the one that uh, Bonnie referred to. Uh, the first one is the uh, Seagrove Forest Road and Seagrove Forest Trail and Multimodal Lanes. This would entirely uh, traverse land in Point Washington State Forest. And the second is the Water Sound Forest Beach Trail and Water Sound slash St. Joe Parkway Multimodal Way. These names are awfully, awfully complicated and make things hard to understand. And uh, this latter uh, water sound forest uh, uh, transit would uh, mostly traverse land in Deer Lake State Park. Uh, both of these routes would transit lands purchased by the state of Florida for conservation and recreation purposes. Uh, I want to read a quotation from the most recent 10-year management plan for the Point Washington State Forest, which, uh, which says, and I quote, the forest was acquired as part of the South Walton County Ecosystem Conservation and Recreational Lands Project. The primary goals of the project are to conserve a part of this unique coast and forest behind it linking three state parks, protecting several rare plants and rare animals, and three, providing residents and tourists a scenic area in which to enjoy many recreational activities ranging from hunting and fishing to hiking, picnicking, and sunbathing. And similarly, the December 16th, 2016 Unit Management Plan for Deer Lake State Park says, the purpose of Deer Lake State Park is to conserve and protect unique water resources and natural communities, including coastal dune lakes within a rapidly growing area while supporting resource-based public recreation opportunities for area residents and visitors. So that's unquote. And as you can see, uh, neither of these plans mentions possible use of land for future transportation corridors. And it can be concluded um, that when the state forest and state park were established, there was no intent to ever permit such use. Uh, in, in particular, I, I, I feel the most egregious proposal is that, that uh, within the plan that call, is called Water Sound Beach Forest Trail and the Water Sound slash St. Joe Parkway's Multimodal Way. And uh, this would uh, transit through Deer Lake State Park. Uh, state parks should be held to an even higher conservation standard than state forests. Uh, although these proposed routes might sound appropriate for, for a state park since they are called trails or ways, uh, in reality they are not designed for recreation within the park. Instead, their primary uh, intent is to convey people from new developments north of Highway 98 to the beaches along 30A south of Deer Lake State Park. Uh, this is not appropriate for, for a state park. And finally, I want to repeat a word that I heard someone say, it might have been Bonnie or one of the other women that are sitting here at a public hearing in 2019 uh, that was at Dune Lakes Elementary School. That word is oasis. Uh, the large contiguous area of, Port, of Point Washington uh, State Forest and Deer Lake State Park represents a last oasis of pristine conservation land in South Walton County that will be increasingly surrounded by development. We are especially fortunate to have preserved this land and other communities would be envious to have such a large tract for recreation and to protect native wildlife and plants. Um, and as someone else already mentioned, uh, the logo for Walton County includes the words preservation and conservation. Uh, please abide by this logo uh, preserve and conserve Point Washington Forest and Deer Lake State Parks by removing uh, the proposed routes that would transit these areas from the mobility plan. Okay, thank you. May I ask you a question? Yes. The trail, as it was identified, going through Deer Lake Park, Yeah. is that for automobiles or is that just bicycles and, and uh, from pedestrian? What my, from what my understanding, he can probably speak to it more, but it, my understanding is 
let's say there's two different things there one they call a paved trail which would just be used for uh, uh, bicycles and and uh, would not be used for any kind of motorized vehicles there is also a uh, multimodal way which would be is being proposed that would allow golf carts and shuttles uh, when you say shuttles, are we talking about combustionable vehicles? Yes. Gasoline, diesel? Tran transit, no, autonomous transit shuttles. It, it's intended to be a transit corridor and a bicycle pedestrian corridor, not a roadway corridor. But in, in, in my opinion, it, it sounds like a road without cars. And that's just not appropriate to be tra uh, tra uh, transecting right through the middle of Deer Lake State Park. Okay. Is it? Bicycles and pedestrians only? Yes or no? There, the reason we have multiple plans is because there's going to be a lot of discussion about these corridors. Some people may feel that a bicycle pedestrian facility is appropriate. So that's why there's a bicycle pedestrian facility identified. If it was bicycle and pedestrian only, would you have any objections to that? Uh, I, I think I would because it's that isn't for recreational use in the park. That's just people going from uh, the St. Joe development, bicycling down to the beach right through the park on, a, on what, it, what would be a, a paved uh, bicycle path. Uh, what I would not be opposed to is some kind of a, which most state parks would have is like a loop trail through the park where you've enjoyed nature and everything like that. But the, this, uh, what's proposed here is just strictly utilizing the state park lands to transit through rather than <laughs> actually recreate within the state park. Thank you. Okay. Um, see anybody. We haven't started the connector road yet. He jumped the gun. <laughs> so, uh, but we might be. I don't know. We. I, I'll ask anybody on Zoom if they want to speak on anything except the, um, the roads that uh, transverse the forest and get them to speak first and then we'll then we'll go to the forest roads. Is there anyone on Zoom that wants to speak um, on anything besides the roads right now, the, one, the forest roads? I guess Megan Harrison's got her name up, but she's muted right now. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. To, uh, to voice some concerns. I'm Megan Harrison, the CEO for the Walton Area Chamber of Commerce. Um, and Kristen, first, uh, just thanks to you. I know this has been a labor of love uh, to get this project and this plan uh, to its final stage for presentation. And, uh, you know, just want to share with, with you all on the Planning Commission, um, from a chamber standpoint, you know, we are in agreement that we definitely need a plan uh, to address some of the mobility concerns. However, after having some extensive conversations with some of the, the businesses that we represent in our membership of close to 850 businesses, uh, in addition to people who you know are, are not uh, members of our, of our organization, um, there's major concern over the the onus is being put on the businesses potentially, especially when it comes to small businesses. And so, you know, our encouragement right now as we're having conversations with our county commissioners is that we identify ways that we can reduce the, the amount of the impact fee even more than it has been reduced, if not eliminated altogether. Um, and, you know, you guys have had a lot of discussion over the sales tax tonight. And uh, when we had the bridge sales tax, uh, the half cent sales tax for the bridge, we were collecting roughly uh, $8.2 million a year is the math that we've done for being able to fund the expansion of the bridge. And, you know, when you, when you look at that as a potential uh, revenue source and you consider the fact that uh, approximately 70% of the sales tax collected in Walton County is from visitor spend, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty attractive in terms of creating a consistent revenue source versus, you know, putting putting major fees on small businesses and developers. Um, 
the other benefit that we see of a half cent sales tax would be that it allows projects throughout the county to be funded versus only funding projects within the zone where it was collected. And so, you know, that that can help us to prioritize projects along the 30A and 98 corridor that are critically important. But it can also allow us to prioritize some projects that are off of those corridors in the areas where the individuals who own these businesses that are, you know, vesting their livelihood in our communities, that we're putting in mobility projects in the communities where these individuals live. So north of 98, north of the Choctahatchee Bay, uh, up to the Alabama state line. When you factor in that we are the fastest growing county in the state of Florida and the fifth fastest growing county in the United States of America, and you are considering essentially biting the hand that feeds us by, you know, implementing a, a massive fee, um, you know, it can, it can squelch our economic development. Uh, even worse, it could allow development to continue, but corners to be cut and our aesthetics that we get to enjoy here, uh, the beautiful place that we get to call home for that to be tarnished, uh, you know, to some, some, you, you calculate some of the money, some of these numbers on the fees, and they might not sound like much to some, but when you look at it from a residential aspect and think about the demographic north of the Bay, and if someone, you know, were to put a 2,600-square-foot mobile home on a piece of property up there, they're going to have to pay $1,300. $1, and to some of, some of our long-term residents, $1,300 is a lot of money. And, you know... I just want to make sure that we're thinking about this in the whole big picture format that we are considering the impact on the people who are investing in this community, the people who are uh, desiring to make this place their home, who want to pour into this place financially, and that we are making good decisions uh, for, for the benefit of those people versus the folks who may come and visit a week to a month out of the year. Um, you know, the, the other part is that uh, you, you've seen the construction that we've been dealing with the last four years on 98, and these projects along the 30A corridor and scenic 98 especially um, are going to create even more traffic issues. And so I would encourage you all to consider, you know, when construction is done on these projects. Um, I, I just was out of town for spring break for my kids, and where we visited, they were doing road construction and mobility construction projects, and they were doing them at night. And I think that that's great because it doesn't impact your day-to-day, -day, you know, mobility and, and moving about. But that's an increased cost, and so, you know, I would encourage uh, the the planning commission to identify if the the cost that's being estimated for these projects is based on daytime construction or nighttime construction. Uh, and you know, last, I'll just say I want to echo many of the comments in the room uh, today, especially uh, Bonnie, I, I would like to, to say that, you know, to me it's, it's critically important that we maintain the character of our community uh, and that we not create a uh, potential impact on our quality of place that we get to enjoy. Uh, I'm a lifelong resident of Walton County. I'm raising a family here. Um, you know, I get to, to represent the business community in the position that I serve in as CEO of the chamber. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful place. It's a wonderful opportunity. I have family that has two small businesses uh, in Decuniac Springs. And, you know, I just think that, that we've got to make sure that we are looking at the long-term potential trickle-down effect of if you, if you build a gas station and you have an additional 150 to even more thousand dollars of impact fee you know that that we're not going to run the risk of things being built poorly um things not being attractive and and helping us to uh you know maintain just the beauty that we get to enjoy here as as long-term residents thank you ma'am <clears throat> anyone else on zoom want to speak um to uh, the other issues. All right, Celeste Cabina. Uh, I want to speak on the issues, uh, not just the road, but all of the impacts on the state forests and parks. We'll, we'll go so, ahead on that. We'll come back to the road issue in a minute, okay? Okay, just didn't want to miss my opportunity. No, we'll bring you back. 
you can go ahead on this issue if you want. If you've got another issue, you can go ahead and speak on it. We'll bring you back on the road issue in a minute. Well, I, I, I do want to address something that I'm not finding um, on the, the website, but at one point in time, there was a, a big parking area in um, the Beach Highlands neighborhood, and I oppose that because Beach Highlands is one of the older neighborhoods where people live, you know, and to put in this big mobility uh, transit area in our neighborhood just kills our neighborhood. And I think that's something that if, if it is still in there, should be removed. It's not and in I there. Just wanna... It's not in there. Okay. This, this uh, won't address any specific um, parking areas or things like that right now. This is just on the general mobility plan. That would come up in a later right. a later time that would would be voted on. So you'll get a chance to right. look at that again specifically. All right, and I do want to speak on the roads in the forest and the park uh, when that's appropriate. Okay, we'll bring you back for that. Okay, um, John Libowitz. Oh, I'm sorry, you, you moved up quick, James. Halsey. Easley. Easley. Sorry, James. <laughs> Go ahead, James. Thank you very much. Um, I'm here representing the Florida chapter of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, uh, specifically opposed to the Seagrove Forest Road uh, for a number of the same. Okay, we'll bring you back in a minute, okay? We're not talking about that issue right now. We'll bring you back, okay? Just no problem, man. My hand's not up. You called me, so I got it. Okay, sorry about that. We'll bring you back in a minute. All right, John Leibowitz. John, are you there? You're, you're muted right now. Can you hear me now? I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, John. Okay, uh, John Leibowitz. I'm president of the 30A Alliance. Um, we represent several communities along 30A, and first off, we want to appreciate the work Kristen and the uh, planning department has. It's been a long journey to develop a plan. We're very supportive of having a mobility plan. Uh, anybody that's been on 38 the last couple of weeks is really starting to feel it. But if you look at the numbers that um, were shown earlier, and if you look at all the work that St. Joe's can do, not just in Walton County and Bay, I mean, there's over 30,000 homes gonna be built over the next 10 years within you know, a 20 mile reach of 30A. And so most people, regardless if we like it or not, will want to come to 30A and, um, you know, enjoy the beaches that we have here. So having a very thoughtful, balanced approach to a mobility plan at 30A is critical. And I would encourage the planning group to consider a couple things. One is there should be some short term things to relieve some of the current pressures in the plan and having a longer term plan. I think there's some things that could be done within a year that can help relieve some of the issues and we're happy to work with uh, Kristen and the group on giving some ideas and she's been very forthcoming and asking for our input. And the other thing is, is I know there's a, I know there's a lot of concern about impact on aesthetics of 30A and I don't think the presentation today did justice on the plans for trying to keep the 30A aesthetics and improving it. And I think there needs to be more time spent on that in the presentation. So thank you for the time to talk. Thank you. Got anybody else? Jackie Fudge. Yes, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I live in Beach Highlands. I'm a full-time resident and have uh, owned property here for 11 years been coming down here since 1957. So I've seen dramatic changes over the decades. Um, I, I have some observations and a couple of questions, um, but just wanna, part of it is just to put out some food for thought here. Um, so we're looking at a 20 year plan. And when you think about what was common 20 years ago, the internet really wasn't that commonly used. It was pretty much in its infancy. Cell phones were changed, had, have changed dramatically over the 20 year period of time. Um, my initial thought is, will some of this infrastructure be antiquated by the time it's implemented? I know plans can evolve and they change over time. But so for example, GM has committed itself in four years to have 
30 new EV models to sell to people, and by 2035, they're going all electric. So that will occur before this plan is fully implemented. Just food for thought there. Um, uh, they mentioned in a presentation there were 220 projects as part of this plan. Unless I've missed it online, I'm not seeing the details on these 220 projects. So I would like to see uh, more information about um, some of the various components that have maybe we've looked at a higher level presentation here, but it would be helpful to get down in the weeds a bit uh, before it goes forward for full consideration and approval. Um, I, I too have questions about how the construction would be handled um, of, for anything. And we, any of us who live in the third quarter have experienced that when they're working on a bridge uh, and, you know, for six months or whatever, you can't drive down 30A. So uh, we're all very sensitive to that. Um, if I, my calculations are correct, uh, we are currently at about 28 feet with the two 10 foot lanes and the bike and bike and, and hiking and um, walking path. Uh, and if we go to the plan, it's 57 feet wide. I'm real curious to know how that will all fit, especially given that um, the TDC has spent money on um, adding parking, parallel parking spots up and down 30A on Grayton. I know they've done it down here on the west end of 30A. Um, so I am concerned also on the environmental impact that of that much hard surface would have on our coastal dune lakes, which are rare. They're one, we're one of six places in the world that have those. So I think we need to do everything we can to protect them. Um, and also the impact it would have on quality of life, especially in a storm. I have neighbors that have built these giant homes, which actually are rentals that sleep 30 people. So I wouldn't call it a single family residence, um, but they put in concrete driveways and then the streets flood as a result. So if we're gonna add all this infrastructure, asphalt, whatever it may be, we need to look at our stormwater uh, handling, how we're gonna deal with that. Perhaps that's part of the 220 projects, not clear to me. Um, and then a question that I posed um, when there was a public hearing last month was how are we gonna incentivize visitors to use all these new options? I'm just real curious to know how we can encourage this um, you know, I see people, I live a block and a half from the beach now, from the new access over here by Stinky. And I see people who rent next door to me who get in a golf cart and drive a block and a half, <laughs> which to me is, is kind of silly, but it's what they do. Um, and then I would like to also question the representation for the West End at the meetings prior to December, 2020. Um, most of us were really not aware these discussions were going on. It was all handled by Seaside Institute and a few select groups. And I'm not sure that uh, the West End has been fully and adequately represented at the prior meetings. And I think that's a serious problem. So um, anyway, just wanna lay all these things out there. I think it's important to um, maybe take a step back for a second and um, get more detail. Thank you. Oh, and I'm going to post to the road before us, but sorry, had to throw that in. I'm not going to speak twice. Thank you. <clears throat> There's a really detailed list of all the projects in your packet. So if they go to the agenda item for tonight, they can see its appendix of the agenda item. All of the projects are listed in detail. Uh, Kristen, how many of these projects will come back when, when they're when it's decided that they're feasible to start them, will they come back and go through the development order process? Or will this- They'll have to go, yeah, they'll go through the, uh, the, the board, pro you know, the county commission will have to. So kind of how this plays out later is that the county commission will have to develop a schedule of capital improvements. Usually this is five years. Um, and they will have to prioritize the projects that they're gonna fund and, com <coughs> and do in that initial five years. So that'll be an agenda item every year. It'll be looked at with the budget. So, you know, anybody that, you know, has input on projects that are happening during that time frame will have an opportunity, opportunity during the budget and also as the five-year schedules is developed and projects are prioritized. And 
I guess they'll also be looked at as to, as she put, if they're antiquated or not. If they are, then they will be brought up speed and. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's one of the cool things about the sort of the flexibility of the alternative lane on 30A is it could be anything, you know, it could be, you know, robots delivering packages. It could be, um, you know, all kinds of things in the future. It doesn't have to be, you know, what we have slated for it now. And, you know, we kind of are looking at this 30A corridor, especially as a technology corridor. We think that's a great solution moving forward for the corridor. And we're, you know, looking to involve with that technology. She's, so, she's absolutely right. I mean, transportation sector is changing dramatically before our eyes. Um, it's, you know, it's just not going to be what it is today in, in 10 years. So other than just the overall plan, we're not specifically um, okaying any particular project that's going to move forward. All we're doing is looking at the plan as a whole and saying if the plan as a whole is something we agree should move forward, but we're not we're not designating any project to, to be started and move forward with, right? Right. Okay. The key phrase I heard tonight was this is a living document. Yes, exactly. It's, it's fluid. Which is good because it's going to need to be. Um, do we have anybody else uh, that wants to speak on before we go to the roads? Okay. Then we'll go to the roads. And all I ask is whoever wants to speak on it, we want to hear all your ideas. Um, for or against. I doubt there'll be any for, but we want to hear all of them that are against. What I do ask is that you please don't repeat each other because once we've gotten an issue on the record, then we don't need it but once, if you don't mind. So, uh, who would like to speak on the road issue? Oh, so we're going, I was going to allow you all to speak first now since y'all are here, but we can go to the, uh, we'll go to Zoom if you want to. All right, let's go to Zoom. Um, Oh, Celeste Cabina. Yes, okay, go ahead. Uh, yes, um, uh, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. All right, um, commissioners, I think before this plan moves forward, you need to remove all of the infrastructure that is proposed on Topsail Hill Preserve State Park Brayton Beach State Park, Deer Lake State Park, and Point Washington State Forest. Uh, and the county has absolutely no jurisdiction over these state parks and, and forests. Um, this land is owned by the citizens of the state of Florida, and it's managed by the two state agencies, and all of the management is guided by the Florida statute. And I believe Dave Cawson mentioned earlier that each, um, uh, I guess, each state park, each state forest has a 10-year management plan. And the state works very carefully on these plans. They don't just randomly draw lines on a map. They have planners and biologists that work on making sure that anything that is put in that park or that forest is not impacting or doing something that is not allowed within the Florida statute. And I can tell you, the roads and a lot of these trails will not be allowed. And, you know, bulldozing through one of North America's most biodiverse ecosystems is just absolutely uh, horrendous. And that's exactly what would happen. You know, we are one of the top um, biodiverse areas in, in North America, the Florida Panhandle. And the area where they want to put the roads and the trails are uh, wetlands. They drain into Peach Creek. They drain into the coastal dune lake. Um, and so I think that needs to be removed and really focus on the real problem which is 30A and, and, and its traffic problems. You've got plenty to do there. And there's a lot of folks out there that somehow believe that this road through the forest uh, is going to solve some kind of traffic problem, but it is going to create another traffic problem down on 30A. You've got 300,000 people from St. Joe, and I got that number from Kristen. She, th she said it the other day in the workshop. And so you got all these people um, that are, they're going to want to come down to 38. They're going to want to come to the beach. 
it's not like you know the the few people that live down in this area want to leave this is going to be a card or that will create a worse situation on thirty a but besides that there is no authority for walton county to be planning in the state parks and forests furthermore there has been an additional study the adkins traffic study or the connector road study that was initiated a couple of years ago they had several meetings back in 2019 in may of 2019 there was an agency meeting and i've quoted there was a document i sent over and i'm not sure if you got it until today i sent it last week but it seems to be there was a glitch on getting it into your packet but um at that may 2019 agency coordination workshop i attended that meeting and i have the minutes and i'm quoting them every agency that was there not just the state parks and forest folks but we have federal agencies that deal with the state parks and forests and uh they all said the environmental agencies are opposed to any alternative through state park service or forest land so nobody wants the road there that is in charge of uh managing those lands and also there were some utility companies there there's an easement there but the state forest manages and owns the state owns the land underneath the easement that is an alabama electric easement alabama electric was there and they were like no we don't want to have anything to do with this so i think the county needs to look at other alternatives for transportation and everything in the state parks and forests that is in this mobility plan needs to be removed okay thank you ma'am are you done are you finished uh that's it but i think again just stay out of the state parks and forests is what i'm saying and then y'all can go and do whatever you want on 30th all right thank you all right we got lori hood hi uh it's lori hood as you know i was there for most of the meeting in person but had to come home so now i'm on zoom so uh thank you for this time um i just duplicate so many of the the comments tonight um tonight i'm actually representing the florida wildlife federation which is a statewide nonpartisan conservation nonprofit. Um, we think that the proposed roads through the forest and deer park lake will serve to save a few minutes of driving time for travelers but will permanently degrade these amazing areas that make our area unique the bisecting of these lands will increase population i'm sorry <clears throat> will increase pollution from automobiles and stop wildlife movement and no doubt will lead to increased road kills in addition, the Dune Lake system is such a rare jewel for South Walton, and this road will only further degrade their water quality. As South Walton continues to develop, we must try to retain the special natural areas that make us so attractive to tourists and our residents. The forest and the park are critical to that effort. Please remove this road from your planning. Thank you, ma'am. Patrice? Yes, hello, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. I own property in Walton County and um, I understand you have a lot of traffic challenges and I do support the mobility plan projects along existing travel corridors, but I strongly oppose the placement of new transportation facilities through state-owned conservation lands. And I ask that in your motion tonight, you recommend removal of them before you send the plan for adoption. This would allow elements of the plan with broad support to move forward, especially the, the fees that you need while we explore alternatives to urbanizing our conservation lands. Um, in regards to the road, I really feel that, you know, the result is gonna be disappointing. I think it's an over promise and a, an under deliver situation because um, at the February 2nd workshop, Planning staff said that there will never be enough roads to accommodate the growth 
that's coming, especially when you think about the Bay Walton sector plan. So this is kind of, to me, a Band-Aid approach. It's kind of what may be perceived as a low-hanging fruit, but in reality, you know, even if you were to get through the permitting and the state agency approval, I think the road would be extremely expensive and cost prohibitive because it would cross a vast network of wetlands that's also interconnected to the coastal dune lake watershed. So there are significant ecological impacts to consider. But I do have a couple of potential solutions. And in line with the first gentleman that spoke today, I like the idea of getting a workshop together where people can offer alternatives because, you know, we care passionately about these lands and they really, you know, define the sense of place for Walton County. And I think we will forever regret it if we allow these plans through state conservation lands. So a couple of ideas I have are, number one, you know, we have a land use issue. It doesn't make sense to solve all of our land use issues with transportation. The whole idea of these communities, especially the denser ones, is to get people out of their car to be able to walk to the amenities you need. So we need to bring emergency services closer to the people, not the other way around. So the mobility plan, while it's identifying areas for transit hubs, should identify parcels near the corridor that are available to build at least one standalone emergency room and law enforcement and fire department substations. Because let's face it, the travel distance right now already from 30A to the nearest emergency room is already too far, too much time, and that is not going to be fixed by the addition of this road. The second idea, in addition to bringing the services to the corridor, is to add more dedicated emergency lanes along 30A and then another that connects 30A to 98 to reduce emergency transit time. I want to be clear, I'm talking about on private lands. It's been mentioned multiple times that the Bay Walton Sector Plan is going to be a huge generator of traffic, and I really think we should explore further a private public partnership with St. Joe to place an emergency use only lane on their land. One corridor could be east of Deer Lake State Park, so I really think we should think about that if they would entertain that idea. The other thing is to increase road capacity of the existing Water Sound Parkway. I believe it's only roughly four miles from where the forest road is proposed. The other idea is to adopt a more strategic, carefully sequenced evacuation plan for emergencies, hurricane emergencies, fire, and then also allow sufficient time for the multimodal concept proposed outside of state on lands to work. I mean, there's some very good ideas here to get people out of cars and think out of the box, and I think if you give those a chance to work, that it will alleviate some of the traffic concerns. And lastly, you know, Kristen said you had the best engineering team in the state of Florida, so let them go back to the drawing board and figure something else out. I mean, please don't ask your constituents to sacrifice any more of our state forest or state park lands, and please discourage development in vulnerable areas and conserve these parks and forests for future generations. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure I said that, I mean, to chance. I'm just... Said what? He is good. Oh, best engineer. James, you're up again. James? Thank you very much. Sorry it took me a second to find the unmute button you put up for me. As I said, I'm James Hayes. I'm actually here representing the Florida chapter of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers and also tangentially several other conservation groups, including Safari Club International, the Florida chapter, the, pardon me, United Water Followers of Florida, and I won't go through the entire list, but we as a united group strongly oppose the road through the Seagrove, the proposed Seagrove Forest Highway through the state forest largely and first and foremost because it sets a terrible precedent. Respectfully, the state forest is not a county resource. It's a state resource, and if you attempt to push a road through 
the state forest, you're essentially establishing a precedent that this is an acceptable course of action any time there is congestion or it creates an inconvenience due to development. Um, it's not an, an anti-development uh, tirade. We understand the complexities that you're facing um, because so many people are coming. Uh, we don't uh, oppose the mobility plan in general, simply that small section of the plan. Um, we intend to continue to oppose the plan if approved right on through uh, attempts at obtaining state approval. Um, and frankly, and to, kudos to uh, Ms. Shell explaining that long-term planning is required or moving forward without long-term thoughts is, is, is essentially reckless. And respectfully, I believe that trying to move forward, um, attempting to drive a road through a state forest is essentially reckless planning. Um, we just ask that you respect the environmental concerns that I'm sure a lot of other people will continue to address uh, and appreciate uh, the sanctity and the mutual trust that we, we as, a, as a society and a state have, have have indicated by, by setting aside state conservation lands. They are important, they are necessary, and they have essentially equal necessity to transportation needs. Thank you for the time. Yes, sir, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, John. John, you there? Hi, uh, thanks again for letting me talk. Again, John Lebo with 30A Alliance. So um, one of the things that I might like to suggest is um, you know, there's got to be a sense of urgency around a mobility plan. If anybody listened to the BCC meeting today about what's going on in spring break, uh, something's got to be done to manage what's going on along 30A. If, in fact, it means taking a connector road and separating it from the mobility plan and maybe having a different discussion in a workshop, I, th I think, um, you know, the 30A Alliance would be interested in working with the county and maybe holding a workshop on what could be some of the alternatives for egressing in, uh, in and out of 30A, both from an emergency and connector perspective, but we've got to move forward with a mobility plan. And if it means separating the road from this discussion to get the mobility plan in, that's something we should consider. And I would suggest that, you know, we'd be interested in partnering with the county on developing a work plan around uh, a different conversation on connecting roads. Thank you. Thank you. Chase? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Chase. Uh, I don't want to belabor uh, a lot of the points that have been made already because I'm going to say the same thing. I just want to go on the record as being opposed to the Cedro Forest Road. Yeah, my name is Chase Waller, and I'm the back country on this board. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Josh? They're not putting them on there. You want to? Yeah, oh, okay. Josh, please give us your last name. Uh, Josh Locke, Josh L. All right, go ahead. Did you get that? Uh, Yes, sir. I am uh, in total opposition of the Cedro Forest Road. I would just like to put that on the record. Also, I would, as a backcountry hunters and anglers member, uh, I, I would like to also state that there are ongoing conservation projects in currently in the process and, and uh, once again I am against this road all right thank you uh, Matthew please state your last name I think you're muted Matthew Matthew? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, go ahead. You guys hear me now? Yes, please state your last name. My please. name is Matthew Nolasco, N-O-L. Nolasco, spelled N-O-L-A-S-C-O. Thank you. 
I'm also, I'm also a member of the Florida chapter of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, and uh, I would just like to, like, again, the fact that it sets a horrible precedent for uh, using state lands and other natural areas as a travel corridor. Um, as been said, in this meeting, there is a lot of proposed development in the future, and I believe that building a road, uh, the Sea Grove Road specifically, would put a bad precedent and uh, allow for the further development of that area into the future. That's all I have to say. All right, thank you. All right, we don't see anybody else on Zoom, so um, yes, ma'am, you have another statement on this? USA twice. I'm not going to repeat anything. I'm just going to say I'm the only one that hasn't opposed the road, so I'm opposing it officially. Thank you. <laughs> okay. We were wondering about you. Yes, right. <laughs> uh, yes ma'am. Barbara Morano, before I read a statement from South Walton Community Council, I just want to say uh, 30A Alliance is a group of homeowners on 30A, and I really th want to thank them for saying that they want to push the mobility plan but take the state road out of it. I think that's huge that they made that. Uh, when Kristen mentioned um, the one thing that always focused me with this mobility plan, which we're, a lot of people are in favor of it, Kristen, if we take the road out, but we'll, we'll get to that, is her example of the bridges and working with the Department of Transportation and that if we don't have a plan, uh, we're just not going to get where we want to go. And the commissioners don't want to kick the can down the road. I know that. But we don't want to put the can in the state forest. So I'm going to read this information. <coughs> For those of you who are not familiar with South Walton Community Council, we're 501C3. It's an organization that's been around since the 1990s by volunteers very dedicated people. And in fact, there are very dedicated people that have preserved Grayton and Topsail. We all know that. And we're out to preserve and protect the enhancing the quality of life. We have sent this letter to the commissioners by Alan Ficarra, who's our president. In regard to the proposed potential road through the forest, South Walton Community Council asks the commissioners and the planning department to please take a careful look at all the alternative routes. And the, one of the ladies, I wish I got her name, spoke about lots of alternative routes who had s asked Lee to come up with some suggestions. And she did. For any connector road, including the viability of maybe putting the road on private property, the road that is proposed in the mobility study would negatively impact Point Washington State Forest, Deer Lake State Park, and South Walton Community Council feels a very high burden must be met before use of well-established conservation land is considered. In particular, St. Joe owns the property just to the east of Deer Lake State Park, and this land, which is already partly developed and slated for further development, could potentially house a connector road while preserving our conservation lands. Kristen has stated many times that the St. Joe's development north of 98 in eastern South Walton and in Western Bay will bring 300,000 people into the area. As a major contributor to the need for a new road capacity, it seems appropriate for St. Joe and St. Joe land to be considered as the primary part of the solution. By way of background, we remind the planning commissioners and the commissioners that in May of 2019, with the Atkins study held an, an agency meeting, all federal state agencies, this is what uh, Celeste mentioned, involved in the management of Point Washington State Forest and Deer Lake Park spoke on the negative impacts of the proposed road and the state statutes that protect this conservation lands. It was also a meeting in Dune Lake Elementary, and this is going back two years. This is why that public meeting needs to be separate from the BCC. They had a they rented where they used the Dune Lake Elementary Auditorium, and Atkins presented his their study. You had a ton of people there who were opposed to the connector road to the state forest. The people who spoke for it were the developers and the engineers. We got hit with HB 631, which took control of the beaches out of the county. 
We can get hit again if the state changes hands. If, if we go in with a connector road, it could become a four-lane highway. It could be a development. I mean, we just don't know what that future is going to be if we let that land go. So I thank you. I appreciate your time. And please consider making a recommendation for a better day at the, for uh, the ordinance. And Ms. Ms. Brooks, you mentioned if there has to be any changes in this plan, what the procedures would be. And it's a public meeting. I, and I think we have Steve Hall on, on call. And having a public meeting means a big deal. And that's the trust that we're asking people to to have in the county when we go ahead with this mobility plan. Because it's fluid. You mentioned that, Don, it, Dan, it's fluid. But we have to trust that the people who run the county are going to listen to the people and make that fluidity turn out to be clear. All right, thank you. Thank you. Is anyone else speaking on the road issue? Okay. We will close public comments then. and. Um, Kristen, you want to address any of this that has come up? I mean, I, you know, we definitely want to get, keep the mobility plan moving forward. I think it's probably a good idea to do a workshop on the forest road because there are a lot of ideas, and we've looked at a lot of ideas, and we're probably not communicating that. We also probably are not communicating the model results very well, and all of that takes so much uh, time. You know, it's not a bad idea. We don't mind doing a separate workshop on the forest road. Um, you know, because I'm like I'm not really sure what St. Joe land we're talking about, and you know, different things like that. So um, we're happy to do that. You know, if that if that would help, and we can do that in between now and the April 27th uh, BCC meeting. Kristen, this road <coughs> is this the uh, in Seagrove, right next to the substations, the road that's already there that goes out to 98 for the power trucks. It's the, uh, well, the proposed path is the power line, last I heard, and Chance is here, he can talk more about that. It's the power line, and it, I mean, it comes into 30A. Yes, there looks like to be a power substation there. Yeah. <coughs> it's already cleared. Yep. Area. I've written down yeah. it. It's, it's there. Yeah. Wait a second. Sir, I... Public, we've, I'm sorry, but we've closed public comment for now. Any other commissioners got any questions? Are we getting ready to make a motion and vote? Well, we're asking questions, but if you want to go ahead and make a motion, you can, but uh, as we're in discussion right now, it doesn't mean you can't make a motion if you want to. I just had a comment to make before we do vote. Okay, go ahead. Um, in the most simplistic of terms, there's two choices here. Do nothing. Go forward with the plan. Try and make a decision, I think, for myself. And I think the worst thing that could happen done in the past can never happen. So I'm going to support the mobility plan. I'm going to going to support it with the spirit that it is a fluid document and that what we decide on today, uh, circumstances may change it in the future, and I'm always uh, for change as long as it's for the better. So that's where I stand on this, and I'm going to support it, the mobility uh, plan going forward to the BCC. Um, I certainly like the idea you must have the data, but uh, one of the questions that came to my mind, even though I've been in a couple meetings before and it didn't occur to me, but when I'm reading this again over the weekend, it's what kind of data do you have on places that, now I'm going to address only a small part right now, but I think it's true for the whole plan, on the multimodal mobility and how, how long an area, how big an area did they use? Are they using as much space, as many miles as we're talking about doing on 30A? That could make a, a big difference on how well it functions. So I just, the idea of seeing some of that data appeals to me. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm, not, I'm, I'm definitely feel that we need a plan. We need to move forward. Do I specifically like some of these things? No, but I believe that there's, it's 
as you've said, it's, um, they all have to go through approval. They all have to go through the approval process. So I, I really do think they need a plan. I think they need to move forward. Yeah. And like the parking issues, you know, that like Melissa brought up, I don't mean to cut her off, but these are things that are really kind of in the detail level that, you know, we can work with neighborhoods on. I've already been to two HOA meetings right. out there in that particular area. I, we can work on those things and come up with solutions at that level at the right time. But, I mean, we've got to get sort of up out of the weeds and moving, if we can, uh, on the big picture. Yeah, like I said, these individual projects that you're talking about like that, the roads, all that will come back before us and the planning and the, and the county commissioners, correct? Yes, I mean, any funding decision has to be made by the county commission, either in the annual budget, you know, or through some other appropriation by them. I mean, we're pretty, you know, we can't just do things without appropriating So everything's going to have to be yeah. individually voted on again before it goes forward, is what we're saying. Yes, or in the budget or the five-year schedule of capital improvements, they will have to make those decisions, those financial decisions at that time. And Miss Barbara, just so you know, I feel your pain. You said you've got some trust issues, and we're putting a lot of trust in this. I've got the same issues with uh, when I see all this uh, grand development, and they say this time we're going to get the infrastructure right. You know, it's all part of the plan, and I'm, you can only judge the future based on history, and based on history, I've got some uh, trust issues too. And I'm just going to trust that this plan involves all the proper infrastructure and we can quit poisoning our aquifer and our bay. Better stewards of our natural resources. So, okay. Make a motion that we uh, go forward with the mobility plan. Can I ask you to add one thing? I know Ms. Morano wanted to make sure that this was set up as a separate meeting for the commissioners. We can put that as a recommendation in there in your motion. Separate meeting for the connector road? For no, for the mobility plan is what she was asking. It made the meeting too long. Oh, I was there. I totally concur. I'm not, <laughs> I, I'm not, uh, to be honest with you, I'm not sure if we can change that one given the time frame, but we can change the adoption hearing to another special meeting. We'll just make the recommendation, and yeah. if they decide they want to, they'll know how much it's going to take, how long it'll take, and all that better than we will. So. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So we got a we got a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We are adjourned. Gentlemen, lady. Goodbye. See you, Dan. It didn't take us long once we got, but, you know, we got everybody talking. They got to say their piece. So, uh, I mean, that thing still got so far to go. Oh, I know. It does. Yeah, it's like, I hate it.